Sim. Okay, I see everybody is uh, joining. Um, welcome, uh, welcome to the meeting tonight. It should be quite an interesting one. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Jack Sarfati on, and uh, we're going to be discussing some very interesting topics. Uh, we're going to try to stay out of the um, overly esoteric without having some science behind it. Uh, and that's where Jack uh, and the work that Jack and uh, mem members of his team have been working on. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome you in case you're looking at my background here, the background screen. Uh, this is historic uh, Bell Labs, Western Electric Bell Labs. Uh, if you notice the site itself, the site is uh, in the shape of a two-point transistor. This is also where the transistor was invented back in 1947 by Shockley and his team. Uh, this site is also the site where the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show, but the Big Bang Theory took place. And um, that was Dr. Wilson and Dr. Pernaeus. Uh, they discovered that, and it is to this day still a fact and um, has not been refuted. Um, of course, also with that, we have now thousands of exoplanets have been discovered over the past couple of years. Uh, and that puts us into the realm of some of the things that Jack is going to be talking about tonight. Um, I'm not going to take steal his thunder. Um, I'm going to let him steal his own thunder. Um, also, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for showing up. And um, hopefully you're going to be getting a, a quite a mind dump of information. And it should start you uh, thinking. I see Russell Targ has joined. Hi, Russell. Thanks Hello. for being here. Okay. Um, also, uh, Bruce uh, Pierce, I think Bruce joined. Is Bruce on? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I had some trouble getting on, and that's why I wasn't here earlier. I apologize. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, both, uh, both of our illustrious guests, Jack and Russell. Thank you, as well as everybody else. We appreciate you joining us tonight and spending some time with us. Happy to be here with you. Let's see. Okay, now I guess we're just waiting for uh, uh, for Jack to join us. Well, I'm here. Oh, Jack, you're here. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, yeah, just, I'm just going to fix something on my screen here, get a little bright. Okay. Uh, just no idea. Yeah. Okay. So, see, me, see, you and, see you and read you five by five, as they say. Um, All right. You know what? Can, can you ask people to just ask questions? in chat so we can see what the questions I'm, are. I'm doing, my, I'm doing my housekeeping right now, Jack. Okay. Um, as Jack has just said, uh, I'm going to have you all muted, uh, but I'd like you to use the chat, uh, the chat capability. If you have any comments or uh, concerns or questions, put it in there. We'll get to that to a, at a Q&A portion of the meeting. Um, and also, by keeping you muted, we'll be able to keep this going on. I'm going to turn this over to Jack. First of all, Jack is a theoretical physicist. Uh, he has quite an extensive and interesting background. Uh, most of you or many of you probably are already familiar with him. And uh, for those of you who are not, uh, he will go into some of the, uh, the details. Now, I sent out, at Jack's uh, request, I sent out some videos for you to look at. Hopefully you all had a chance to see them before you got on the, the, uh, uh, at the, on the meeting uh, tonight. Uh, it's important, it'll save some time. Uh, Jack won't have to go and reiterate too many things if you've paid attention to the, me to the videos. So this should flow nicely. It is being recorded. It also will be uplo uploaded to the uh, the YouTube and should be available for all. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. 
Now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. And Jack, uh, it's all yours. Oh, okay. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yes. Uh, okay. So I want to I want to keep things as positive as possible in these trying times on on every level. You know, politically and uh, spiritually and scientifically. So um, hopefully. You, most of you have, have seen some of uh, the technical material, and rather than me just going over that, uh, I'd like to see if anybody has any questions about what they have seen, any any questions to ask me about. So let's start that way, and if that doesn't work, we can we can uh, we can show some of the material. So are there any questions? Can you type them? How, how do they do this now? Okay, um, basically we have two ways of doing this. Uh, we ask that people use chat, they'll type that in and uh, Bruce or I will monitor that and we'll bring those questions to you. Uh, and okay. the, during the Q and A, we're gonna open it up and people will be able to ask the questions themselves. Okay, well let's try starting the Q and A like right away. And then if that doesn't work, I'll go into some of the physics details. Okay. But let, let's right. see what people want to know. I, I want to try to get some, so I sort of want to gauge, you know, who's here and what they, what they really want to know. I, I don't want to repeat stuff that, you know, that, that they already know. Right. Okay. All right. I think I've lost Bruce. Uh, hold on a second. Bruce, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. My camera's on. Now you need to make me a co-host, Joe. Yeah, I'm you. going down. I'm trying to find you on the list here. Thank you. While you're doing that, I'll just make a general statement uh, about uh, the soul, you know, about Gary Nolan and and um, Jacques Vallée's um, Soul Foundation. <laughs> they call it the good, the bad, the bogus. Just let me say the good. The good part is that I, I actually I support Gary Nolan's scientific work on both the. Uh, the, the the blood you know this blood work on the damaged um I mean, the blood work on the damaged um, uh military american military and intelligence personnel that apparently got too close to these uh ufos which are warp drive the uh, the the anti-gravity blue shift causes radiation sickness and that's why they're sick in my opinion and I also support Gary's work um, on the retrieved, alleged retrie retrieved materials that he's working on with Jacques Vallée and with Larry Lemke. And Larry Lemke and I also work together, which is, you know, kind of weird. I know Larry for, you know, 30 years from NASA. And um, so I support that. And I also support uh, the David Grush narrative, the core narrative, because, and I cannot give details for the same reason Grush cannot give details, I have been read into classified military material, uh, which basically supports everything that David Grush says. First-hand sources, first-hand military source, active, active military, okay? And, um, and the reason they read me in, or, is um, that contrary to what you might see in some uh, of the uh, videos and the reports on Twitter and everything, uh, at least the people I spoke to, they have failed to understand. They can operate the craft to some degree, but they failed to understand the basic physics. And uh, that's what I claim that I have solved. Basically, if you understand it qualitatively, that we know kind of what what are the key parts of theoretical physics, mainstream theoretical physics, you know, Einstein, quantum mechanics, stuff like that, relatively, uh, that that explain in a general way the phenomenon. Not only not only the nuts and bolts propulsion part of it, but also the paranormal high strangeness part of it. That you know, Jacques Vallée is actually pretty good at with uh, Eric Davis and Hal put off of these guys, Kid Green, you know, they've written uh, the high strangers, the stuff at the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, all the, the telepathy, the, the what uh, what Russell Todd uh, calls precognitive remote viewing that, you know, also he did with Hal put off back 
in the 70s. I was actually there, part of that, part of that. It was in 1973 and, and a little after that. And, and, and worked a little bit with Elizabeth Rauscher and Hal and, and Russ on some remote viewing field work back in, I guess that must be 1975. So um, yeah, I support all of that. And um, I, I, in my opinion, I've explained it. There's nothing mysterious about any of this. It's all basically applied physics. You don't need any much new physics. Um, it's just mainly an engineering problem now, a condensed matter, nanotechnology, metamaterial engineering problem, which of course, you know, be difficult. Um, and uh, so I claim the basic uh, understanding of everything that's happening is pretty elementary uh, physics, at least the way I was taught at Cornell originally as an undergraduate with Hans Bethe and people like Bethe, you know, from the Manhattan Project, and then later on uh, at graduate school at University of California. So uh, the problem is pretty elementary from a, a conceptual understanding of it. It's not mysterious. And so the bad part of what um, what Sol, what what uh, Gary did, you know, using the prestige of Stanford University and Russ Targ is there and kind of agrees with me, was that um, they gave an entirely false impression that the problem is not really understood and it's going to take like ten years. The Colonel, the good Colonel Kell, whatever they call Nell, what Kell Nell, Carl Nell, I guess is, and, you know, ten year timeline. That's ridiculous. So we already, you know. We basically know how, how it works. So, so that's my main gripe with them. And, um, you know, uh, I gave a talk on the physics of all this at, at Florence, uh, Forenzi, uh, just a couple of months ago. And Gary Nolan was there. Well, he, he, he I was actually physically there. Gary gave a talk, you know, on the same platform. And so uh, Gary should have invited me to talk at this meeting, since he had, you know, the New York Times, everybody's there, you know, and, uh, but, uh, so, you know, he, he, he didn't do a good, he didn't do his, he didn't do due diligence, that's my, uh, you know, uh, Gary is good at uh, sort of taking a holier-than-now stance, you know, how other people are sort of not being honest, and I claim that, you know, he should uh, take the boat out of his own eye. He should have had me there, uh, uh, excuse me, of uh, motorcycles. Oh no, <laughs> actually, that was some kind of a sports car. If anybody of you have seen the movie Bullet, Steve McQueen Bullet, the car chase in San Francisco, well, uh, I live on that street where the car chase was. So these guys like to, especially on Sunday, the Hell's Angels like to go right past uh, my place. So occasionally, if you hear a, a you know a motorcycle engine, that, that, that's what it is. that's what it is on Sunday. So, uh, okay, so that's the situation. Now, uh, at that point, uh, I'll stop here and see, are there any, any questions about Yeah, Jack, I, uh, we have one question. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that Lockheed Martin is in possession of a non-human intelligence uh, materials? I don't know. I don't know anything about Lockheed Martin. That's not the intelligence. I have military intelligence about, about uh, did you ask me about live aliens? No, no, non-human intelligence, whether we have, whether we have, well, what was thrashed in Roswell is non-human intelligence in theory, as per well, Colonel I don't know Corso. About Lockheed. I, don't, I don't know about Lockheed, but I do know uh, I've seen smoking gun vetted intelligence evidence of live aliens. Two different kinds. I know of two different kinds and allegedly a third kind. There, you know, many different ones. The big universe, right? Right. You, DNA code is universal. Life is everywhere. And the, 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 physics, the, phys, the, physics, the physics is so elementary that any civilization anywhere in the universe or any way in it, because it's time travel too, anywhere in the universe, they're going to get this technology. So it is like Star Wars, you know, like the bar, the bar scene in Star Wars, all these different kinds of aliens. So I know for sure, but I can't go into detail because I have to protect my source, who's still active military. And uh, you know, get in trouble for showing me what, what he showed me. Uh, and there was some other person 
with me, you know, to corroborate what I'm saying. It's not just me, but I, I'm not, I can't mention that guy's name either, but somebody who a lot of people know. But in any case, um, what I can confirm is the following, the, the two key parts of David Grush's general narrative, uh, live aliens, not dead ones, live, they were dead ones too, but live ones, at least they were alive, uh, recently they were alive. <laughs> no reason to think that we that they're not alive now. Live aliens and intact, functional, fully functional uh, craft uh, of the kind that Rick Doty calls, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cardinal Three, uh, and uh, it's almost like a grade B science fiction movie from the nineteen fifties. You know, the flight. You know, it's it's exactly the same as what um, as what. Um, uh, Phil Corso and Day After Roswell talks about, you know, 30 feet, about 35 feet, it weighs about a ton and a half. Um, you know, there's in, it's empty inside, you go inside and there's little, three little, three little seats with consoles with the, oh, but it's four fingers, four fingers, not six, not five, they have four fingers. And I've actually seen close up, you know, stuff. Uh, okay, so that's well, real. The, gray, the grays are real, the grays are real. That I know for uh, sure. Okay, well, and that's a, that's a good segue right here. Uh, part of the uh, the rumors or the evidence or whatever you want to call it, uh, short of the smoking gun, if you will, uh, is that the technologies that were found uh, in Area 51 uh, by Bob Lazar, uh, he was working in theory on one of the, uh, uh, the craft, and it was brought up uh, that there were no means of controlling the craft. Uh, other than something that came out of Roswell, and I, allegedly, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. So no. uh, allegedly, there was a device that one would wear on their head that would yeah. give them total control over the craft, how to fly yeah. and everything else. And yeah. I think yeah. one of the questions that they're going to have is that yeah. uh, the, the physics of consciousness and how that may relate to this uh, particular aspect of yeah, yeah, that's all. That's that. That's I. I, I don't. I have. I have a lot of detail on that, but I cannot disclose it because I promised. You know, word of honor. You know, I, I don't want to uh, compromise my source. But basically, that's true. Generally true. And there's no mystery to it. You know, if you read the hippie say physics, the book about me and my guys. You know, and, and Russell and put off and everything. David Kaiser, uh, MIT professor of uh, uh, physics, Harvard PhD, historian of physics, wrote his best selling book 2011. Uh, it was on Nova. You, know, you see pictures of me on Nova, though they don't mention my name. I think, I think they mentioned uh, Russ and Hal, though. But in uh, any case, um, CIA, people from the CIA and the, the military basically uh, funded us back then. <clears throat> and uh, this one guy, in fact, I'll say who he was because he's dead now. George Koopman. George Koopman was an army agent, uh, and um, he funded us uh, at Esalen, uh, the Physics Conscience Research Group. And at, at one point, he said to, to me, and I think uh, Saul Paul Sirak was there. I thought Fred Allen Wolf was there, but apparently Fred Allen Wolf wasn't there. But at one point, this was, I guess, 19 late. Around, Late 1975, uh, on top of Knob Hill by the Grace Cathedral, where Lawrence Rockefeller was funding us uh, in a big flat, you know, across from. In any case, um, we uh, George says, uh, Jack, there are two things the Central Intelligence Agency wants to know: how does consciousness work, and how do flying sources fly? This is 1975, and of course, you know, if, if you go back. Uh, when I first met Russ Targ and Hal Putoff with Brendan O'Regan uh, and other people were there. In the fact, the, uh, the, uh, there's, there's a tape recording of part of that meeting back in 1973. And you'll hear Russ talk about flying sources as time machines coming back from the future and this rabbi and what's it, what's it, Jim Hurtak and all that kind of stuff. So everything, <laughs> you know, a lot of the key Elements of uh, uh, Russ Tom was all, all talking about it back, back then, 1973. It's a long time ago, 50 years ago, right? So, in any case, um, what I claim is that, you know, it took 50 years, 
But uh, I've solved both problems with a little help from other people. I've solved both problems. The consciousness problem is very well understood now in terms of the quantum mechanical physics. And I've given the, the, the references many times. There's this, uh, a paper by Pavel Pilkin. Pavel Pilkin is an eminent cognitive uh, scientist. I think he's from Finland and he's also uh, uh, has a joint, he's a professor in Finland, but also in Sweden. You know, two two universities, and he's funded by the Fetzer Foundation. You know, he's he's, he's a big shot. Yeah, you know, he's a, he's established academic like Stuart Hameroff, so it's the, you know that kind of guy. And he has published a very good paper about a year ago in December of 2023 called "The Brain as a Quantum Measuring Device." It's a review paper for you know for for, for psychologists and cognitive. Uh, you know, it's not meant for a PhD level physicist, although because it doesn't have all the math, but it's meant for like most of this audience, I would imagine. And in section seven of that review paper, an extensive peer reviewed paper, he has the Jack Sarfati explanation of consciousness in terms of Bohmian quantum mechanics and this Freud condensate. You know, we, we, we've explained it. Now, as a PhD theoretical physicist, who studied with Hans Bethe and other people built the atomic bomb Manhattan project, like engineering sort of stuff. If I say I've explained it, that means how do I justify that? Well, you have to have what's called popper falsifiability. There has to be a test of it. And yes, I say we can test it uh, using the Stuart Hameroff general idea. That, uh, I'm assuming now that uh, these microtubules that Hameroff talks about, uh, that, that is the inter that's the transducer between uh, electrical sensory neuronal signals and the uh, creation of conscious experiences of qualia, what, what David Chalmers in the hard problem with qualia. But that's where it happens. But, uh, and if that's the case, just following, just following uh, Hameroff, uh, these microtubules are simply little uh, Quantum, they're basically protein diamonds. They're they're, uh, they're uh, switches. They're quantum. They're qubit qubit switches. And what the microtubules are, they are like fiber optic cables of uh, you know of these, of these qubits. Okay, and so we can build that in the lab. We can make they're called quantum dot artificial neural nets. And in fact, there's a lot of work being done on that in Moscow, by the way, in Russia. Oh, and I should mention, I, they invited me to Moscow State. They wanted me to, I, I got an invitation to go lecture on everything I'm talking to you now, uh, to go last July, 2023, to Moscow State to lecture them on, uh, on this topic. But now I didn't go because uh, 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 they, they physically, I could, they wanted me physically to come, but they said if I couldn't physically go, they would, I could do it by Zoom. I said, okay, I'll do it by Zoom. But that never happened because right before it was supposed to happen, uh, Prigozhin invaded, you know, went sent to the Wagner group up to, up toward Moscow. So I guess that's, I never heard, you know, it, it didn't happen, the Zoom thing. That, however, the Russians, you know, they have all my stuff anyway. And the Russians were involved with us back in Esalen, back in the 70s, back in, in fact, the Russians were involved with us even at SRI, it turns out. I don't know if the Russians are aware of that, the CIA. And everything. So the Russians have uh, been tracking my work in all this, you know, 50 years. Okay, so the Russians, are, you know, the, you know, the Rus the, and this is very important politically in, in terms of intel, in terms of war and stuff like that, what's happening in Ukraine, things like that. So, um, so okay, so the answer is yes, we understand how consciousness works. And we can test that in the lab. And when this happens, what does that mean? That means conscious artificial intelligence. You understand what I'm saying? Conscious artificial intelligence. That means, for example, all these, all the stuff they talk about AI now. Oh, by the way, curiously enough, Sam Altman, everybody knows who Sam Altman is. Sam Altman, you know, the guy with the Jet GP in competition with Elon Musk's stuff. Altman, he lives, he's next to my next door neighbor, literally. That's pretty weird, right? 
<laughs> Sam and Albert's my next door neighbor, right? And uh, although I haven't spoken to him yet. And the point is, all this stuff with artificial intelligence, it's soon going to be as conscious, as conscious as we are. Because the physics of our consciousness turns out it's pretty damn elementary. It's universal. It's almost like gravity. You sense, you know, Penrose says, tries to connect gravity with uh, with consciousness. Well, in a certain way, he, he's right about that. Okay, let me stop here. And yeah, what what else do you want to know? Um, well, does that answer the question? What? Okay, we have. Uh, let's see. Um, Mindy had um, the Archetelos meeting one. All right, I'm not exactly sure about this. Uh, Willie from Pat Marcatillo's group, that's one of the local groups here, uh, meetings 100 years ago. Oh, it was a comment. Um, okay, let's see. Also, I, Robert uh, Morningstar had his hand up. I'm going to ask him to uh, uh, use chat. Okay, and, yeah, how um, can I see the chat? I want to see the chat. Can you, uh, can you uh, put the yeah, chat? Hold on. Okay. Can you put the chat on the screen so we can see it? Well, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I have it on the, uh, the screen right now. Okay, I see Bruce Passman said something. Where is he? How does this okay, work? Yeah. Joe, you need to make him a co-host so he can see the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Hold on a second, Jack. I'll make you co-host. And okay. readmit me as co-host, please. Okay. All right. I see Lori Carney to everyone. If UFOs are coming from the future, what is that? I don't, that's not, then I, I didn't, yeah. it disappeared. I know you're here someplace, Jack. I'm trying to find you. You're, you're missing. Yeah, no, I should, well, I see myself. Let me see. No, no, no. I'm, I'm no. on the listing. I have to find you to uh, make you a co host. Yeah. Oh, so you go it. on talking for, go on talking for a minute while I do yeah, okay. this. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, you know, and the oh, okay. Well, while while we're waiting for you to find that, there's another thing. You know, uh, I think I know how to make an anti uh, missile shield, anti gravity, anti missile shield uh, that would uh, basically make tanks hmm. tanks uh, indestructible. In fact, body armor, infantry body armor, indestructible. Um, Aircraft, you can't shoot them down. Uh, no. <laughs> the, the, the NHI, the, the ET, the NHI, uh, they, they, have, they, they have this technology that we have. I, I've, I've been sort of read. This technology is actually operational, but I think I understand how it works. <laughs> you know, in terms of the, the, the mathematical modeling of it. Uh, oh, the, this is a big thing, by the way. The white hole, <laughs> the white hole, right? The, yeah, the white hole concept, yeah. This is the big thing. And that's one of the reasons I was invited to Moscow. But of course, they already know. So the point. <laughs> okay, the physicists in Moscow are very smart. And by the way, I even know that some that Iranians in Tehran were tra uh, tracking me on all this stuff too. They're not stupid. The thing is that the uh, uh, the the uh, the physicists in Tehran and Iran. Uh, they have a, 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 um, a theoretical physics group based on David Bohm's uh, way of doing quantum mechanics. And that's the key thing you need. You can't, so you can't figure this stuff out. Everything I've done explaining consciousness, if I had used the Copenhagen interpretation, I probably wouldn't have developed it. I, you have to use the Bohmian interpretation. And Bohm, you know, worked with Einstein from Princeton. This goes back to you know, 1950 or so in Princeton. And uh, and Vigier, who I also, and uh, and that's very important. That's the Bohmian point of view that actually solves the problem. And um, and so uh, yeah, we have the okay. Now are we? So what's happening now? We do we see the chat? Okay, now? you yeah you you should be able to see the uh, uh, the chat. Can you see the chat there? I don't see. It. Let me say share more. Uh, no, it should be. A, I think it's on the side. Oh, you have to. Okay, okay. I have to put it. All right. Okay, okay I got. Yeah, it. Okay. Click the chat. Okay. Click chat at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. How do I put it at the bottom? I, it's now blocking. It doesn't. Well, there's matter. a chat. Well, where it says chat, just click on that. 
Wait. You're enabled as a co-host. So yeah, when you okay. click on chat, you'll see the same thing that we're that I'm seeing. Yeah, but I'm just trying to see where the I, I I see three dots. I see three dots. Oh, I click on chat. I see a chat, but it's the middle of my screen. Okay, it doesn't matter. I don't have to see the rest of the dots. As long as you can see me. Right? Okay, well, we, well, Bruce and I can uh uh, we can, yeah, why don't I go ahead and go yeah, through some Bruce, of these questions? Ahead. Yeah, yeah, let's, uh, Jack, let me take over yeah. and, and hand some of it to you. First of all, um, yeah. if you've already covered this, please let me know. But uh, Christy Green asks, what are your thoughts on the article published last month on the journal Modern Physics titled Extraterrestrial Life in the Thermosphere, Plasmas, UAP, Pre-Life, Fourth State of Matter? Do you Are you familiar with that oh, article? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, somewhat somewhat um now there's kind of, i'm working with certain people who know a lot about that and um there was a, there was an article in the in the london newspaper just a day or two ago that was the telegram the telegram for the guardian one of them that they're trying to explain the foo fighters as uh, just plasma you know uh, sort of like uh, ball lightning sort of thing uh yeah um uh, i think it's quite well, you know, uh, do you know about this guy Bledsoe? I mean, does anybody know about Bledsoe? This this guy who claims to uh, see these spheres of light, um, like plasma orbs, uh, that seem to be intelligent and conscious. Uh, and then it's not all, but it's not only Bledsoe. There was remember, Joe Firmage. I don't know if any of you, do, so, of course, Russell know about Joe. Firmage. Joe Firmage had this experience with these plasma plasma uh, uh, sort of ETs, NHI, okay, non-human intelligence, full of like ball lightning kind of things, uh, you know, what are called solitons, self-organizing, um, uh, self-organizing uh, plasmas. And uh, and uh, other people I know, uh, this guy, Dan Smith, who used to work, a friend of uh, CIA's Ron Badalfi, you know, Kit Green, all these guys. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Joe Firmage and Dan Smith, they, they claim to have had the same kind of experience that this guy Bledsoe uh, claims to have. And I got to be careful now what I say. Uh, I have seen classified intelligence that does support the idea that there is a, a species, a, a form of uh, NHI that is a kind of um, conscious plasma, yeah, and that does not uh, contradict. I mean, that's explainable by the physics. So that's and that's kind of what we are. What we are, you know, could say, roughly speaking, what uh, we are are um, uh, conscious electromagnetic fields um, in the brain, or even the, the whole body, actually. You know, bio, bio, bioelectric field, bioelectromagnetic fields. Well, they're not just electromagnetic, they're, they're electromagnetic fields that are hybridized with matter, with the charges, the electric charges, what are called quasi particles, or collective modes, stuff like that, many particle physics. <clears throat> and yes, that's that's essentially what we are. We, we are, we're simply like, so you know, very roughly speaking, we are simply uh, like these plasma. Uh, electromagnetic fields, but we're confined, you know, inside, we're near fields, we're confined inside our bodies. That's what we are. That's what I am. That's what you are. That's, you know, if you want, that's the soul, you want to the mind, whatever, physical mind field. So, uh, so it's not a crazy idea. And I have been read in on, uh, okay, I, basically I know I've been shown evidence for three kinds of aliens or whatever you want to call them. Uh, the grays, the little Grays with the big eyes, just, just like, like what you see in the, in the movies. It's quite accurate. I mean, actually, live ones, okay, they're real. And there's also like a, 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 a kind of a, a reptoid, like a seven foot, you know, a guy, a scary guy. It was like the devil. I mean, you know, there's a guy that looks pretty. You don't want to meet him in a dark alley because he could. You know, he looks pretty ominous. I don't know how friendly they are. I, I know there's a, and I know there are these orbs. I'm pretty sure. So I would say, yeah, I could be wrong, but I would say uh, using Bayesian probability that I'm like 90% sure that there are at least these three kinds of non-human intelligence that are interacting with us now. And I'm sure there, there may be more. Other people say there are more. And I, I don't really, I don't have much reason to really doubt 
that is the case. Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see. Thank you. Uh, let me. Let's go on to the next one. Thank you for for, for yeah. that answer. If yeah. <clears throat> Lori Cardi says, if if UFOs are coming from the future, as yeah. postulated by many, what it what is it they are coming back to change? Do you? I mean, that's kind of speculative. Mm -hmm. But what would oh, you well, postulate? That's, okay. Well, first of all, they're, not, they're coming back. There's a mistake in the question. The question is not well. What, in in uh, mathematical physics, in, in the theory of partial differential equations, they talk about a well-posed problem. See, you cannot change the past. It's what 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 you have. Uh, what uh, there's a there was a physicist in Moscow. I don't know if he's still alive. Worked with with Kip Thorne at Caltech. A guy named Igor Novikov. And if you look on Wikipedia, look at the, uh, the uh, Novikov principle of global self-consistency, loops in time. So they're coming back. And, I mean, you don't change the past, but the past happens because it, of things happening from back from the future. It's all what's called the self-consistent loop in time. A feedback loop, if you will. Yeah, but it's through time. It's like, you know, it's, 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 it's what's called time loops. But if you look at uh, Igor Novikov wrote a, a popular book called The River of Time, The River of Time, uh, an eminent physicist in Moscow. He may still be alive, be pretty old, at least my age. And, um, and, and you know, it's uh, Russ's age. And so he explains all this. Okay, so you know, you know, they're not going to have to change, but we are creating them. Okay, well, we <laughs> have to get into the high strangers. When I was a kid, 13 years old, I was contacted by this kind of intelligence, this uh, said time traveling intelligence from the future. By the way, Ingo Swan was also taught, Ingo Swan at SRI in sessions he had, I don't know if Russ Tog was there, but Barbara Hanaga talks about it with Brendan O'Regan. Ingo Swan would go into a trance at SRI. He'd talk in a cold metallic voice saying, he was channeling a um, a conscious artificial intelligence, like what I'm talking about, conscious artificial intelligence on a spacecraft from the future. Okay. And the whole point is warp drive. The physics is time travel. See, once, okay, what is warp drive? Warp drive is the control of the gravitational field, but with small amounts of energy. That's the trick. See, everybody thought they everybody knows time travel is possible in einstein's the general theory of relativity even if you look at at uh, eric davis's stuff you know he has this uh, book with uh, what is it called propulsion something about propulsion oh i have it right here frontiers of propulsion science yeah was good hang on hang on hang on hang on i'm gonna give my enemy my my nemesis eric davis <laughs> I'm going to plug his book because I don't let personal battles get in the way of science. I mean, can you see this book? This book here. It's not, frontiers, frontiers of Propulsion Science. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, he mentions time travel in here, but, but the problem has always been that they, it would take too much energy to do it. So it's only a theoretical thing. However, can, I follow not, up, can I follow up on that for a second? The last time yeah. we were together, you you discussed the metamaterials and how, if yeah. I if I can paraphrase you and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. that that was the key to unlocking this yeah. capability. So in that regard, if I there's one question I always wanted to ask you since the last meeting was, yeah. what what is the amount of power under your uh, theory of how it can work with using metamaterials and what what could be a source of that amount of power that given or necessary amount of power okay, well, you to see, pull it your, off your, your question is not quite it's all it's all, sort of okay but <laughs> it doesn't surprise me we don't know i mean you're asking me a, you're asking me a detailed engineer you're asking me a technological question all i can tell you is that from observed facts of the like the u.s navy close encounters with the Tic Tacs and all that stuff, you know, uh, Commander Fravo, very small amounts of power. You know, like the same, uh, probably no more than it's in your te Tesla electric car. That guy, you know, yeah, the battery of a Tesla would probably do it. Maybe less. Oh, maybe less. Okay, what do we know? Here's what we know. And also what I know from 
classified stuff. But let's just look at what Rick Doty says in, in several of his video podcasts, which is the same as what is public knowledge in uh, Colonel Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. This saucer, which flies, okay, it's a, which is it's like your time machine, like what Russ Todd mentioned back in 1973, if you listen to the recording. This thing flies, you go inside, it's empty inside. It's just a thin, it's empty inside. So the, all, all, all you see inside, there's no propulsion equipment, there's not, no engines, nothing. Nothing there, except the, this three little seats for the little grays, they're only about three feet, they're like 10 year old kids, eight year old kids, right? They're small like that. And there are three seats where they sit and there's a console with their fingers, okay? And they propel, they, they sit there propel, and through their brain waves are interacting with the, well, the, the, uh, the fuselage is alive. It, okay, there's this guy that people know about David Adir. I just found out mm -hmm. about him today. Yeah. David Adir, yes. his story. Absolutely it's, uh, amazing. The, what? Absolutely amazing, his story. Yeah, okay, something that, okay, a lot of what he says rings true. I know, you know, but some of it sounds a little, you know, he doesn't really know, I don't know. You know, it's a mixture like Lazar. Some, some of the stuff Lazar says is true. But when he tries to explain it with physics, he sounds like a, like he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know, in terms of PhD physicists, you know, like me. Okay, but uh, yeah, everything that Deere says, yeah, he said when he touched the thing, you know, it's alive and all that. that. That's all, I believe all that. That's all, all the case, yes. So the power source is inside the material itself. Oh. It could just be it could just be some radioactive uh, decay, you know, heat from like a little like a like a very slow reactor, okay. And there's a guy. Okay, now uh, this gets us to solve. Larry Lemke, who's a retired NASA engineer, who works with Gary Nolan at the you know, uh, at, at Stanford there and uh, on retrieved materials. They have all these. Uh, I don't know if they actually have a physical sample, but they they have pretty good evidence that there was retrieved material, uh, like this aluminum foil stuff, you know that 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 uh, that uh, Corso mentions in his book, the aluminum foil, um, and I know that's real. It reminds me to tell you how I know that's real. That's something we can talk about. Um, uh, that that's something real. But uh, uh, Larry was saying that that when you touch it, when you try to touch it. This material, uh, it's like a tingling. You know, it's it's a, it, 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 it's it's like you get a, a little electrical sort of tingling, and it's almost like uh, the thing is sending up like a, uh, sort of like an anti gravity field. Okay, and it can make it stronger. See, this is you know, what I'm talking about—the white hole and you know, all that stuff. Uh, and um, and I know that material is true. Okay, because. Uh, I, I will reveal something now because it's 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 from a source who's now died. Uh, there is this uh, a place called Bohemian Grove uh, here. Okay, and um, it's kind of a power place for a lot of powerful people. In fact, it's where Oppenheimer in 1941 or so Oppenheimer gave a talk to important people. Leslie Grove, all these people up at the Grove back then which created the Manhattan Project. And I uh, uh, I had, a, there was a guy, he's, he died, his name is, I'm gonna say who he was, but he's dead, uh, Don, Don Rich, Don Rich. Uh, now Don Rich was a Bohemian member of the club, a high, very high ranking member of the club, Bohemian club, um, which you know was here in San Francisco and up the you know we started with Leyland Stanford all these people back you know hundred years ago, um, and um, uh, Don uh, was also I should explain to Don Rich now Don okay let me tell you about Don Rich Don Rich was born in or grew up in Idaho in a ranch in Idaho Don Rich's father worked closely with Kenneth Arnold. Everybody know who Kenneth Arnold was? Kenneth yep. Arnold. Okay. When Kenneth Arnold, 1947, <laughs> this is, I, I couldn't make this story up. It's so detailed, right? When Kenneth Arnold saw the seven, whatever, the flying saucers, okay, his pilot, when he flew back from that first sighting, 
okay? Don was like five years old, so he remembers. He, Kenneth Arnold there flew and went to Don's father's house you know, on the ranch there, the cowboys, you know, and told him, Don remembers hearing you know, Kenneth Arnold talk about his, his encounter with these flying saucers, okay? All yeah. right. All right, so that's it. Okay. When Don's, when Don's about 17, 18 years old, he's a bit, yeah, he, let's see, he died. He would, he, yeah, he, if he was alive today, he'd be about 82, 83 years old. Well, you know, back when he was about 17, 18, his, Don's brother was already in the Marines, as an officer of the Marines, older brother. And so Don joined the Marines at about 17, 18. Spent time in the Marines with a tank commander, all this guy. So he was a Marine. And um, he gets out of the Marines. I think he was in the Granada operation. I said, no, not, a, not Granada, no, Panama. When, when did the Marines go into Panama? You know, that's fine with the Panama, whenever that was. Oh, that was, yeah. Mid 90s. 80s. When, when, yeah. 90s. 80s. 80s. Was it the 80s? Yeah. Oh, 80s. no, okay. No, no, he wasn't. That was a different one. Okay. He was, they, they, no, because he was already out by then. No, okay, so it's different. No, no. Uh, Don got out of the Marines in the, in like the, the mid sixties, and he was also an artist. He was a, he's, he became a famous sculptor, sculptor and painter. He worked with Rothko, you know Rothko, you know the guy. You know, and he was a uh, he was a professor here at the uh, San Francisco Art Institute. And um, but in any case, it's late nineteen. It's around nineteen sixty eight, nineteen sixty nine. And Don had a uh, foundry, he was doing big steel. They had a foundry in Oakland, in the, you know, this part of Oakland. And this guy named, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Russ, since Russ, this, this may be somebody we know. So Russ Target, you hear this is something that Russell Targ may know something about. This guy appears at, at, at Don's foundry, it's the late 60s. He, his name, but he, we don't know what his real name, but he says his name is Harry Wolf, Colonel Harry Wolf. He was CIA, you know, ex, ex Marine was something. He said, and he said, uh, Don, listen, uh, and also remember Don's brother at this point is like Colonel of the Major in the Marine Corps. And and Don is uh, you know, ex Marine, Semper Fi, all that stuff. You know, he says, Don, we know you're a patriotic American and, you know, we, want, we need you to help us with something. I said, yeah, sure, I'll remember you. What? Don's job for about two years was to take retrieved material from Roswell and other places to be a courier. You know, he had to have a, a small pieces of the retrieved stuff, the stuff that, that uh, Gary Nolan is trying to work on now, right? This is back in the 60s, okay? Remember, this is a guy from Bohemian Club high up in the Bohemian Club, one of the guys who ran the Bohemian Grove. Okay, this is not a, this is not a, this is a, an important person, okay? <laughs> Later on, okay? He's not bullshitting me, all right? You know, with, he, he had to, you know, with, 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 with the handcuffs to the courier, the small pieces and stuff, pieces, and he went on various trips to MI6 in London, to the, uh, the French intelligence agencies in Paris, in Berlin, even Shanghai, even China, and Australia, stuff like that. He was tasked with carrying Matisse's material to various uh, military laboratories of different countries. This is back. This is back before I met Alan Russ. It's back like 1969. So this went on about a year or so, a year or two or so. Okay. At one point, and this is really important because it confirms a lot of stuff. And this guy's a Marine. Marines don't lie, okay? They don't make up stories, all right? Uh, Harry Wolf comes and he has a duffel bag, big duffel bag. It says AAF Roswell, Roswell NM on it, duffel bag full of you know, stuff. And Harry gives, he says, Don, just keep this for me for about a week. He says, but don't look inside. Don't open it. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, because uh, what does that Don do? He opens it, right? And inside, guess what? Guess what he found? Remember, if you read, if you read 
Phil Corso's book, uh, The Day After Roswell, talks about the strut, you know, the strut with the, like the Egyptian hieroglyphics on it. There it is. It's right there. He's got it. Don's got it in his hands. Had it for a week. Now remember, Don's at a foundry. He's a foundry. He's a he works with metal and welding torches and assembling torches and you know he has a crew whatever they have there you know Bruce, he melts steel and all that right it's a foundry right? and he tried he did stuff he couldn't you know it, it, like if you, if you try to damage it it was like living it'll set up the anti what I'm talking about set up you can't touch it, you can't talk but if you but if it likes you the thing was like sentient if it likes you. You can crumple it and it's like night and all and it goes apart, okay? This thing is a conscious artificial intelligence. He had, he had the peace, all right? And then he said, times, this big, at times it could become weightless, it almost float. All right, it's, it's done okay, on the ridge. Okay, I, right. I, I got a question here, uh, Robert Morningstar. Yeah. Uh, he's been waiting quite a while to get his question okay. answered. Uh, Jack, what do you know about Motion Science's work with Hal Putoff and Kit Green's announcement on X today of a breakthrough with gyroscopic technology? Uh, I think it's bullshit. I hope to be wrong. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, C okay, CIA guy, Ronald Pandolfi, has, um, he's a PhD from the University of California in physical chemistry, smart guy, but, you know, Pandolfi, uh, was involved with the national intelligence estimate going to the White House every day for many presidents, including Donald Trump. I think starting with Ronald Reagan. Uh, I know Ron's, I know Ron's brother too. Uh, Ron's um, uncle, Benami's uncle, was a top guy in the CIA. And uh, back around 1980 or so, when Ron got his PhD from uh, UCLA, in, I think in physical chemistry. They recruited him into the CIA, and he was he worked with Kit Green and the Weird Desk and all you know, all the old UFO stuff, all the weird paranormal stuff. Um, all this gyroscopic, and even actually, I think get uh, Eric Davis. I mean, I haven't seen the report, so I, you know, I may not be accurate here, but I haven't seen. What, re repeat what you just said. What what, what just happened? Gyroscopic what? Say it again. Could you repeat what? Oh uh, yeah, said? breakthrough, and he said gyroscopic technology. Now gyroscopes, navigation. That do what? Um, uh, that's as far as it, that's as far as it went. Well, yeah, it's too vague. I mean, they do know there was a guy Lathawaiti. If you look at again, if you look at uh, Eric Davis's book, he talks about all that stuff. It's always gyroscopic. So you know, Joe Fermich was into that stuff. In fact, Joe Fermich apparently ripped off Brandon Fugel with this bullshit, with this pseudo stuff. Had Brandon Fugel talk to me, I could have warned him not to do it. <laughs> I mean, Joe, Joe Fermich, you, know, you got, okay, you know, this is the uh, the Mormon, the, the Mormon connection, the uh, Salt Lake City, Utah connection, you know, well, you know, Robert Bigelow's a Mormon, right? Bigelow was into all this stuff too. He's a Mormon. Joe Fermich is a Mormon. In fact, Joe Fermich is like the great, great grandson of Joseph Smith, you know, they got the, you know, sort of like the royal family of the Mormons, okay, in Salt Lake. And they're probably, you know, Howard Hughes and all these guys. Were, uh, Brendan Fugel. They're, they're into all this UFO stuff because the Mormon religion itself is a UFO cult. You know that, you know, and, and actually so are we. I mean, all the sky gods, all the <laughs> stuff. You know, Yahweh is an ET, you know, Star Bethlehem, that whole kind of thing. Uh, does Diane Pasolka, she talks about that, I think. And she's right. And I think even, you know, Jacques Vallée, a lot, you know, Von Daniken, all these guys. They're basically correct. So in any case, um, uh, there's all this stuff with the gyroscopes and uh, this guy Lathwaite was uh, in England and they claim anti-gravity from spinning gyroscopes. That's all, you know, it's all bullshit. It doesn't, that's all bad, they're just not good physicists. You know, that's all conservation of angular momentum and it, you know, it looked like it's sort of anti-gravity. It's not anti-gravity. So I don't know what these guys are claiming. I haven't seen it, but if it's like that, then it's nonsense. Yeah, you know, it's just more. Uh, it's what Ron opened off. He calls them crooks and loons. That's what he's talking about. These guys don't know anything. You know, they, 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 they mean well. Some of them they believe it, but they don't know enough basic physics that they don't know what they what they're doing. Okay, and unfortunately, that's true of a lot of people in the intelligence agencies and the military as well. I mean, so you know, it, this is a big problem that people don't understand physics well enough.
So, but so, so if that that's what it sounds like, now, I don't know what you, you're saying. Hal Putoff was involved in this. I don't think Hal. Uh, Kit Green and Kit Green and Hal Putoff were involved in it. Uh, okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, in, in a while, we're going to open it up, and uh, yeah, I Robert can ask you directly. Detail. It sounds. It sounds. It sounds. Some guy. It, it must be an inaccurate report because I know Hal Putoff. Uh, it works with Eric Davis, so and Eric Davis says it's bullshit. So I'm pretty sure Hal. I, I think Hal is being misrepresented here. That's what I'm what I'm beginning to think. I, I'd have to see the deal. I don't know. Bruce, do you have anybody else you uh, out there? Yes, we do. <clears throat> um, going back to what you were uh, indicating, uh, uh, Bill Corso said in, in his book, but also what you suggested might be a, a connection. Um, Kim Erickson asked, uh, "What what do you feel is the connection between consciousness and metamaterials, and is there a connection? And, and do you have a yeah, any yeah, speculation on how it works?" Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Just what you got to do is first do your homework. I, can, I can't explain, you know, a whole theoretical thing about Bohmian and quantum mechanics in two seconds, you know, a sound bite. Uh, but you, if you read section seven of the Pablo Pilkins paper. I uh, just look at it, just Google uh, the brain as a quantum measuring device. I can't, you know, it's a Finnish thing. I can't spell Finnish. You know, the Finnish, like the Hungarians, have got this crazy alien language. <laughs> Finnish, you know, Hungarian. Uh, but if you look, Pavel Pilkin, the brain as a quantum measuring device, section seven explains uh, uh, how consciousness is a simple, uh, what I call post quantum physical process. And the metamaterials, are, are, okay, the, the micro, we are metamaterials. Our nervous systems, the, the, the subneuronal structure, what are called the, at the microtubule level, the nanometer level, we are organic biomolecular metamaterial. That's what we are. That's what, our, yeah, that's what organic, that's what living matter is. So all we're doing is imitating our own subneuronal right. structure in nano, with meta, that's what metamaterials are. Well, but most most organic uh, living matter is a is an organic metamaterial. Okay, Kim, so, I hope that answers. That. Okay, yes, we have thanks. another we have another question okay. here. Yeah. Uh, could you build a small compact fusion reactor, an artificial star using using TikTok type warp principle? You say that again. I don't understand the question. Okay, uh, could you build a small compact Fusion reactor using the tic tac tic tac type warp principle. Oh, oh, oh okay, uh, okay, that's okay. I don't know about a small one now. Um, actually, Larry Lemke, who works with Jacques Vallée and uh, and Gary Nolan, has uh, been studying some small. I don't know if it's a, not. As, I don't think it's a fusion reactor. I, is it a speed? No, I think it was a fission reactor. Uh, but there may be, okay. Now, um, what I do know, what I can tell you is this. At the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, there's a group, there's a guy named Michael G. Anderson and the whole team. He's the project leader of what's called the warp. I thought it was warp fusion reactor. I think it's just warp reactor. And um, my God. Oh. Water hang on. <clears throat> and um, uh, Mike Anderson, hello, what happened? Oh, Joe, you're sharing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me turn so what happened? Mike. Mike Anderson. Oh, do you want to you want to show the thing on the screen or something? Yeah. Yeah, I, the, I have the uh, one of the things that you sent out. Okay, has go a ahead. Picture go. picture of that. So yeah, bear with ahead. me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you could show that, that'd be good. Uh, go ahead and do it. But uh, Anderson, uh, he was interviewed by Tim Ventura, I guess, about July of a year ago. And it turns out they've been using uh, my equation, my idea, my basic idea for um, controlling gravity with small amounts of energy. They, they, they took that idea and they put it in a proposal what's called the warp fusion reactor, but their machines would be pretty big. It's a $250 million project. I don't think, I don't know if they've been funded yet. It's a $250 million machine, Lawrence Livermore, they want to build it. I don't think they built it yet. 
it would be 30 feet by 60 feet, which is interesting because just today, David Adir talks about when he went to Area 50, allegedly when he went to Area 51 in 1971, he was went underground. They, there's this underground facility under the Groom Lake, uh, under S4. And they had, he had a, they, there was a 60 foot warp fusion reactor there in 1971. Okay. <laughs> but that's a giant machine. It's not tabletop. Yeah. And <clears throat> they're claiming that they could, they want to generate a warp bubble. Now, this warp bubble <coughs> swallowed the water the wrong way. A tiny warp bubble, you know, a gravitational warp bubble, <coughs> about one ten millionth of a cubic meter, a little sphere, one ten millionth cubic meter in volume, and it'll generate a gravitational field sixteen thousand times stronger than the Earth's surface gravity. You know, the acceleration of gravity at nine point eight meters per second squared. This is sixteen thousand times bigger. You know, at the surface of this little bubble. That's what they're trying to do. Based on my equations, yeah, and their machine, it's a hot fusion reactor. What, what it is, it's a it's an ion plasma. They have like two, apparently, I don't understand the detail. Yeah, it's com very complicated, but they have, uh, 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 they, they basically collide two beams of uh, hot ion plasma they compress it, you know, in high temperature. Yeah, you know, it's enormous. It's like, it's like a little sun. It's not a black hole. I, I was worried well, it was like a black hole. No, they're not. It, it's still many powers of 10 weaker than you would need to make a black hole. Okay. So, um, but the point is, that's not what, how the Tic Tacs work. The Tic Tacs are empty inside. Just like, the, you know, like when I was still at Colonel Corsi, you go inside, it's empty. Very small amounts of power. So, although you can, you know, that's like the sledgehammer approach. Yeah, you can make maybe a, a, a you know a very powerful machine like they, they actually want to do it at Lawrence Livermore, but that's not going to help explain what the U.S. Navy, what they, what Commander Fravor and Ryan Graves, all these guys are reporting, right? It's not going to explain those things. It's not going to explain Tic Tac. Tic Tac is much more is, is much more gentle, right? It's like Aikido. It's like martial arts, right? It's not it's not a sledgehammer. So does that answer the question? Yeah, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to bring this up quickly so you can show it. Yeah. Hold on, um, it's coming. <clears throat> oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that's the machine. That's but that that machine is uh, sixty feet long and thirty foot high. So, uh, but it is the kind of machine that David Adir talks about allegedly at uh, Area Fifty One in nineteen seventy one. Nineteen seventy one. Okay, how could that be? If you, if you look at David Adir's thing, and I was somebody told me to watch it today just by the chance. I, I didn't know about I think I vaguely heard David Adir's name, but I never really paid any attention to it. Uh, but if if what David Adir says, he's like Lazar, right? David Adir is like a Lazar type guy, the story. Um, and some some of what David says does ring true to me because it does fit what David Grush talks about, and it does fit the classified material I was shown. Okay, some of the very, you know, so, uh, it, plus it also fits some of my own experiences. So uh, uh, the thing is this, uh, what, if David Adir is telling the truth, and he seems, I mean, you know, he's, he's a guy, he's an old guy, he's not actually, he looks, he looks a lot worse than me, he's actually younger than me, but he looks like he's near death. In fact, he, had, he almost died three weeks ago or something like that, he was, he was clinically dead, you brought him back. I was kind of, I won't go into all the details about Adir, but, um, but he, uh, you know, he, uh, he, what he describes is uh, pretty, okay, what, what, what I was gonna say is that, 
if what he says is true, that back in 1971, they had this underground, 200 feet underground, 20 miles long underground, with all these different craft, he saw all these different kinds of UFOs, different designs, like from different time periods, because it's time travel, right? And he describes technology. They had all kinds of technology in 1971, like retinal recognition and all the handprint, all this kind of, and they had a lighting system with no shadows and there's no, I mean, what he's describing back is that under Area 51, there is this lab back in 1971 that itself could not have been made with the technology of the 1970s. This is before computers, really. You know? In other words, they had a lab that had future technology because the time travelers came back and built the goddamn lab. We didn't build it. But they doesn't, built it. But, uh, Jack, doesn't that violate the, uh, the one side said can't change history? But if you come back no. there and invent something, no. are you? No, 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 no. It doesn't violate at all. It's consistent with everything I said. Whoever says that means you don't understand the love of what I'm talking about. Things are in the past because of future influences. Okay, now listen. It's what's called, if you read, you have to read Novikov. Okay. You have to go on Wikipedia, the global self consistency principle of ego and Novikov. It's right there. You just got to read that. If you don't read that, then you don't understand. Yeah. But you this is like the past, can't, but can't you can't it. change the past. You can't change the past, but the past is what it is. Because of time travel. Okay. The past is what it is because it's a self consistent loop in time. So, um, that, that, now the thing is this. Um, so, the, the, the point is if a deer is telling the truth, if he's not simply a great actor, because, you know, good actors get Academy Award. <laughs> and if he's telling the truth, <clears throat> then that's more smoking gun proof for time travel. That, we actually have the Amer the government, you know, all this stuff. It's not just uh, who's who's saying this is it Michael Sala. Who are some of the these not EXO? Who are these guys who are talking about that? There's been uh, uh, you know agreements between the ETs and with Eisenhower and all that stuff. You know, if that that's if that stuff is that may, I used to be very skeptical of that, but now I'm not. I'm getting more, you know, because I mean, what happened to me was pretty weird. So um, if that's all true then it's smoking gun evidence. No question, it's time travel. And also, the basic physics is so elementary. As soon as you can control gravity with small amounts of energy, that's time travel. And I can, you know, you have to, that'd be a whole course in physics. If you, I try to explain it in my lectures in Florence. That you, that's the, you saw the, the PowerPoint, the movie PowerPoint, you know, with the bending of the light cones, all that kind of stuff. So if a deer is telling the truth, that's, that laboratory under Area 51 is future time travel technology from the same people controlling the Tic Tacs, who are also apparently able to neutralize our nuclear weapons. Right? There are a bunch of who's the guy? Uh, who's the main guy uh, with the who wrote the book about how the UFOs are neutralizing nuclear weapons? Um, oh, that. The, uh... Who, who's that? Yeah, I can't think of the name of him, but you know, you know who I mean, right? He's a yeah. very solid. I think he's, he's dead now. He typically died recently. Um, you know, he wrote a book, uh, and yeah, you know, that's all. There's a lot. You know, a lot. A lot Robert of, Hay with, Robert Hastings. Hastings. Hey, Hastings. Hastings. I think yes. it's Hastings. Yeah, Robert Hastings. Yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. So there we are. So UFOs uh, and nukes. Yeah, yeah, and and it's not just him. There are other people. Was it at Rendlesham, the place in England too, where the oh, UFOs Rendlesham went Forest? Yeah, Rendlesham, you know, with the uh, the well, you know, American. To, to this day, there are activities around anything nuclear. We have nuclear power plants right here. Yeah. We have for the past year year or so, we've had all types of sightings at a plant that is exactly the same. Our oldest nuclear plant in this country. Is yeah, Bruce Cornet, Orchid River. Bruce Cornet, yeah. Bruce Cornet, and it's the same one that Fujishima. It's the exact same model that Fujishima. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we've had all types of activity, daylight and nighttime uh, activity yeah. down there. Yeah. 
So, so, but the main, but my main message today is that the physical understanding of everything that's being reported from the propulsion, you know, the high acceleration, because you, you understand what, when we see these ships doing like five, uh, Kevin Knuth, okay, he was at Seoul. See, that's a boy, I was got pissed off. So you have a guy like Kevin Knuth, and he, he's a, you know, he's a good physicist at, uh, you know, uh, yeah, he's a professor of physics somewhere. And what he reported is true. If you use conventional propulsion, the thing looks impossible. Like you're pulling 5,000 G, nothing could stand. But he didn't mention warp drive. With the warp drive concept, everything is understood right away. The, the, the different kinds of acceleration is what's called the kinematic acceleration, in Einstein's theory of relativity, general relativity. When you're, when you're looking with light rays at something at a distance, uh, it looks like it's accelerating at high G, but inside the ship, it's zero G. They're weightless. It's the same thing like with the uh, astronauts. With the astronauts going around on the space station, they're, they're floating around there on the place, uh, space station. That's warp drive, really. Uh, but they're floating around, but it looks like they're accelerating. It's like they have some centripetal acceleration, right? That they're accelerating. But then, but the, the, it, it, as it turns out, we're the ones who are accelerating. The people on this solid Earth we are actually the ones that are accelerating, but we're not moving. See, this is the whole trick. When you feel weight, that's called proper acceleration. And that's caused by electrical forces. And the reason that's because because gravity is curvature of space-time. So you're in a non-Euclidean curved space geometry or space-time geometry. So what happens if you're in a, if you're if you're in what's called flat space-time? where there's no gravity at all, flat space time, and if you accelerate with a G-force, then you have to move from place to place. It's, that's called kinematic acceleration. But in, 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 in a, in a non-Euclidean geometry, you have to accelerate in order not to move. See, it's counterintuitive. People don't get that. The rocket engine, the people, don't, they, they don't get it. They just don't get it. I mean, talk about generals don't get it. Politicians, congressmen don't get it. The military and the CIA director doesn't get it the people what's his name the guy that kirk patrick he didn't get avi loeb avi loeb apparently doesn't get it either even though he's the head of the smithsonian he's a good he's an instrument guy but he doesn't understand general relativity he doesn't say the concepts very well because they wrote this paper and they never mentioned what i'm talking about which solves a lot of the mysteries right away it's warp drive it's control of gravity you know so they, they don't make so what that, that they don't even mention it. And then they, they have this meeting with Stanford, all these big shots and everybody's there getting all kinds of worldwide publicity. And they totally misinform the people by not giving the obvious explanation that demystifies the whole thing. There's no, there's no big problem anymore. But why, are they, why do they want to keep it mystical? Maybe because they want to get money. You know, it could be more of this kind of, you know, sort of, taking taxpayers' money for a boondoggle for flim-flam projects, which is, you know, what this is what, what um, Ron Pedolfi is, is basically saying. That's his big yeah. gripe, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Um, we have some more uh, questions <laughs> on the... Uh, um, here is one. When the non-human intelligence unidentified yeah. aerial phenomena Tic Tacs come to here and now to do whatever, it is they are coming here to do what happens to them do they self-destruct i'm not sure about that, that well, I don't vladimir pantovic i don't know when when they self-destruct i don't know anything about that i don't, you know, I don't think let's not waste time it's, it's it's a stupid question okay bruce do you have one you want uh want to pick okay i'll run that yes um not this is from Michael uh, Perone. Uh, not considering unification with the other forces, is the public knowledge of quantum electrodynamics incomplete in your estimation? It seems like it is, right? That's a valid question. Yeah, it's about, but you know, it's it's uh, it's not really too relevant to our purpose here. But all science is incomplete. It's the nature of scientific knowledge. You know, we we, we keep it's a. It's like error correction. We keep getting, getting it more, better, and better. Yeah, quantum electrodynamics. I mean, <clears throat> all of it. Everything is incomplete. What science is, in fact, all forms of 
of empirical knowledge are incomplete. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a, what's called the girdle, what's the girdle, the girdle incompleteness theorem. <laughs> <laughs> Always being built on and refined and added to or. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, everything, it, it's what's called, it's a Bayesian probability theory is a good way. There, uh, all our object, all our scientific knowledge is uncertain. It's always un it's like it's like a general uncertainty principle, like, like quantum mechanics, but it's a, on a more, more general scale. We everything I say, to the extent that it's scientific, everything I say has a certain probability of being wrong. If it's not, if if there's no way to prove it wrong, then it's not real science. By the way, okay, so let me tell you. The, I used to hang out a little bit with Richard Feynman in the 60s. You know, find, find account. I was down at La Jolla, UCSD, and I would drive up my little sports car and to Caltech. It's like 1965. And actually, I first met Feynman in 1963. And, um, and Feynman would say, Jack, always try to prove yourself wrong. Right. There's proper falsifiability because it's easy to fool yourself. Okay. And the whole thing about science that you test it, you can't ever prove anything. It's not like proving a mathematical theorem, you know, with logic. It's different. All you could do is like disprove it, really. Try to break you know, it. The right. principle of pop and falsify it. So, yeah, of course, quantum electrodynamics is all kinds of stuff that can be done. Yeah. And I think what Perron is talking about, now, this is like an academic thing. It's not that important to, you know, for the UFO issue. But um, the, the point is that the, uh, Feynman's quantum electrodynamics is built on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's not built on the Bohmian. Bohmian gives more detail. And also there is, um, now even within the Copenhagen, it's uh, something called the weak measurement theory. The quantum electrodynamics today is based on two things. It's based on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, that the wave function is a complete description of reality, which Einstein never liked, and neither did Schrodinger, but Bohr and von Neumann and Wigner all accepted it, and Wheeler even accepted it, and Penrose accepts it, and actually even Aharonov today accepts it. But there's also this thing called weak measurements. So the uh, standard, what's called orthodox quantum mechanics as taught in textbooks and university courses, and as described by, say, even David Kaiser in his book on the hippie safe physics, uh, that's all Copenhagen interpretation and what's called the strong measurement, the von Neumann strong measurement and the born probability, okay? Now, Yaki Aharonov, uh, actually way back in the 60s, realized that you can, the strong measurement is like a zip file in computer, uh, in, you know, in, in uh, quantum information, well, just information, theory. the zip file, zip file, you can unzip the file and you have what are called these weak measurements. And these weak measurements is another level of detail, of detail in the quantum theory. And so that's not included in, in the current Feynman diagram technique. I found it's not included. And also the Bohm, what are called the Bohm trajectories are right there too. So yeah, there's a lot of work that can be done to further refine what's called quantum field theory, not just quantum electrical dynamics, but quantum field theory, including the strong interactions and the weak interactions, <clears throat> and even, maybe even gravity. Um, so, and, and there's also, this, there's another aspect of this one. There's this guy, Mikhail Altel, Altelsky, Altelsky in Moscow. There's a lot of good physics being done in Moscow. And uh, they, what, what I call using wavelet, wavelet multi-resolution analysis, the wavelet transform. Right now, all of uh, physics is based on what's called a uh, Fourier transform, and that's scale independent. And you lose a lot of information that way. You see, what, what, to, what you want to do is, oh, it's right, actually for our problem, for the metric, in fact, for, for the reverse engineering, we have to use what are called wavelet transforms because the fuselage of these things is like is like a metamaterial. What is a metamaterial? It's a metasurface. It's a bunch of these artificial little atoms arranged in a lattice on the surface. All right, and actually, it's many layers. It's it's, it's like it's multi-layered, but uh, stacked metasurfaces, <clears throat> and um, and so each each uh, meta atom, each like node in the lattice, like a crystal, like a two-dimensional crystal, each meta atom. Um, uh, 
is a is a is a location in which you things are being done. So you have to have like a you have to know the the frequencies and the wavelengths in that little meta atom region and how it changes to go from different meta atoms, you know, you go different parts of the fuselage. See, because different parts of the fuselage are generating different kinds of gravity and anti-gravity fields to create the maneuverability. You know, when uh, if there's a dog fight between a tic tac, a warp drive tic tac, or, or what uh, what uh, um, what do you call the cardinal three? If you have a dog fight between a flying saucer and an F eighteen or F thirty five, right? So the flying saucer is able to do all kinds of stuff. It can, you know, it can turn on a dime, right? It can, it can be going 20,000 miles. It can be going Mach 10 and turn, do a right angle turn. The the F-18 can't do that or the F-30. They, they, have to, they take miles to make just a little turn because they, 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 you know, they're, they they're moving through space. The Tic Tac doesn't move through space. The Tic Tac stands still in space. It's manipulating the space itself, space and the time itself, mainly space. So it's a totally different, different thing so you have to be able to control what is called the warp the near gravitational field at different parts of the fuselage some parts are doing anti-gravity some parts are doing gravity it's complicated and you need the conscious artificial intelligence that's built into the machine itself this machine's alive you can david adir right what he's talking about that stuff and the thing is computing in real time it's a super super intelligent computer it's computing you know microseconds every 10 to minus 12 seconds or so it's computing stuff which you know which the, the human even even our even our non-conscious computer our ai that right now the f-35 say but there's a lot of ai in there right so so how, where does the ai work on uh, about a is a nanosecond is down to a nanosecond or is it just microsecond i forget well it's microwave frequencies or gigahertz whatever so but the uh the uh but it's a classical computer so presumably the conscious post quantum computer command control system of this uh, meta surface fuselage uh, is computing even faster and more powerful than any of our most powerful non conscious artificial intelligences. Okay, does it sort of do I make it? Let me tell you, the brain is the human brain is the fastest computing system right now, I believe. Yeah, yeah, but uh, so this is like the, the okay, okay, the mech. Oh, good, good, good point. The mechanism inside the fuselage of the machines are the same, or, you know, are the same as the mechanisms causing our consciousness to play. Okay. We're uh -oh. doing it, you know, very uh -oh. basically the same. Okay, but it's right now. Think, but, 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 but more powerful. Maybe actually they, they the same physics, but you know, probably more complex and you know, more powerful than us, even. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I promised that we would open up the uh, QA uh, to everybody. So here's the way we're going to do but, it. Anybody, Joe, let me, like let me jump in. Oh, hold Joe, on a me... second, Bruce. Hold on. What I'd like to do is have everybody who wants to make some type of a question or a comment, it'll have to be brief again because we're running out of time. Use the raise your hand system, and Bruce and I will monitor it and, and activate okay. you and let you. I'm going to take a very comment. fast. I'm going to take a very fast break. Get that going. Be right back. Okay. okay. So okay, what you do is get. Go ahead, Bruce. What do What do you want to say? Well, no, he's gone, so I can't ask him the question. Well, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. We see a couple of hands going up. We're going to wait for. Uh, uh jack to get back i see russell how you doing russ happy to be with you okay. i know i know people have a lot of comments for you hi robert hey bill okay all right well how how's everybody doing so far everybody's still with with jack yeah can i have a question for jack Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Want to wait for him to come back? or That, that would be a good idea. Okay, so we'll have uh, Russell, Robert, and William. And uh, as the hands pop up, we'll recognize them and uh, ask you to unmute.
Oh, I also I notice. Okay, there he is. Yeah. Okay, Russ, uh, Russell, uh, you go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. Yeah. Yeah, my comment for Jack is that at, at SRI, we were able to do experiments where a person could see into the future yeah. and the precognition experiments were just as good as the real-time experiments that shows yeah. the future is affecting the past. Yes. And we then later, a couple of years later, used that to forecast changes in the silver commodity market. And we did that without error. Doesn't that say yeah. that we misunderstand something about the nature of causality? No, no, wait. Okay, can I answer that now? The uh, This is already well known. The Yaki Aharonov, already in 1964, published a famous paper that was ignored. Unfortunately, I, I wish I had read it more carefully. I, I didn't even know that. Uh, the, the whole, the, what, what Yaki Aharonov's, what's called the two state interpretation of quantum mechanics, leading to what are called weak measurements, explains quantum entanglement as uh, future, future causes of uh, past effects, backwards in time. The future causes are very important. If you don't understand yeah. causality, you can't understand physics. Yeah, okay, well, I'm agreeing with you. What I'm saying is that there's a standard mathematics, like whole literature, hundreds of papers now, <laughs> the past many years, it's, it's, it's called the two-state the two state, uh, uh, the two state uh, uh, interpretation of uh, Haran, of weak measurement theory, and they do it in the lab. I mean, they're, they're things done in the lab that can only be explained backwards in time. Now, recently, Roger Penrose himself, Penrose recently, just a few weeks ago, gave a talk on this very thing, showing that even in his gravitational collapse idea, it has to be backwards in time, that, 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 that the quantum future causes. So you have both. Things that happen in the present are happening both because of past and future causes kind of colliding in the present, causing what's called a weak measurement, a weak, a weak experiment. So that's all, uh, that's all um, uh, you know, standard physics almost now. That's, that's the modern view of quantum mechanics. And this guy, Huey Price at uh, Cambridge, you know, he has written, if you go, U, Huey Price, uh, H. UW Price, okay? You go on the archive, the uh, Cornell Print Archive, and you see Yuri Price just written a bunch of not very nice, uh, popular, semi popular papers explaining this whole thing. So there's nothing contrary. I mean, that much is known. Now, the problem is the problem is this signaling. Can you, you see the problem is, yeah, everybody will say, yes, in, you could have what's called temporal entanglement where a future, but something that happens in the future affects what, what's happening in the past. But when you do a statistical analysis, when you include the quantum statistical fluctuation effects, what happens is, this is the no, the no broadcasting theorem, the no cloning theorem, what happens is that everything looks random, but that's not what happens in the mind, right? In the mind, we're seeing in remote view, you're, seeing, you're not seeing a random noise, you're seeing a picture seeing a picture so that's what's missing and that's why you need that's why you need this extra pope bomian thing what's called the action reaction thing that they leave out so there's a missing the, the mad left something out so they'll say yeah what 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 uh what a guy like david kaiser would say what these standard guys would say is yeah you can have these effects backwards in times but you cannot use them in any practical way in other words, they would say precognition is impossible, telepathy is impossible, because they would say even though the effect is there, it gets washed out when you actually perceive something, it looks like random white noise. That's what they that, would say. That's not true. Small. But yes, it's not true. I agree, it's not true. And the reason it's not true is because in their mathematical modeling, they've left out a key mathematical thing which is called the action reaction. And Russ, you were there in 1996. You were there with me and Hammer off at Tucson. Yes. And we had talk. I gave a talk, and then uh, the bunch of people were there. Uh, Brian Josephson was there. Put off was there. Harold Morowitz was there. And there was this guy. I think he's dead now. You know the, the holographic brain guy, the, who worked the bone. I think he's dead now. You know the bone. 
to work down the hologram theory with Bohm. Uh, I, I don't think he's alive anymore, but he was there. And you I know, talked. Are you thinking about Penrose? No, no, Penrose. No, no, it was this other guy. The pen was so wide. <laughs> no, it was this other guy. Uh, like he was like a psychologist working with Bohm. Primrum, Carl Primrum. Primrum. Carl Primrum was there. And a uh, bunch of people. In any case, I gave a talk. I think I'm talking. I gave a talk about action reaction. You're trying to say that it's not going to be random. The problem is, and, and I got that from reading Bohm. See, but David Bohm, David Bohm had already in 1993 in his book, The Undivided Universe, he brings up, but he died. I'm sure he died before, you know, Basil Hiley had to finish the book. Uh, Bohm was like Mozart finishing the, you know, the Requiem and then uh, Solari, you know, finished for him. But Bohm and Hiley briefly, in 1993, they briefly talk about how if you include the reaction of the particle on the wave, on the quantum wave, you can get entanglement signaling. You get the non-randomness that, that you observe, okay? And so I caught on to that and, and I started talking about it. I mentioned it intuitively, you know, qualitatively in, in ordinary language like, like now at that talk, you were there. The problem is I didn't mathematically do it that mathematically the way I should have done it because I'm a lazy, I'm a lazy dog, you know. <laughs> I didn't do it, but uh, let, let's see, twenty years, no, ten years, twenty years, almost twenty years later, this guy Roderick Sutherland, who's a theoretical physicist in Sydney, Australian, he did it. He took the idea I was talking about. I, 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 he may have gotten it independently, maybe, but the, he took the same bait, the Bohmian theory, he put in the act, the reaction, he modeled it in terms of Lagrangian's you know, standard mathematical things, something I should have done but didn't do. But Pendolf, I'm not Pendolfi, Roderick Southern did it for me. And he has published these papers, beautiful papers, in which he explains the, how the action reaction works in a you know, in a kosher Lagrangian Feynman, you can do Feynman action principles, whatever you want. You know, it's real solid theoretical physics. And he explained the idea. And that's what you need to explain what you actually empirically report. So the answer is yes, we understand what you see. We understand it. It doesn't violate any laws of physics. It's consistent with the most modern what's called the post-quantum mechanical extension of orthodox quantum theory using the Bohmian interpretation, which he did with Einstein. Okay. So you find room for quantum, for retrocausality in your theory? What? You find I just room told you, that's it. That we have retrocausality, it's part of the theory. Yes, the answer is yes, yes. Yes, we understand it perfectly, mathematically. Since, since Sutherland, you've read Sutherland's papers, there it is, all there. Whatever you okay. Okay, yeah, we have two things I want to say. I'm yes. going to let this go on as long as people want to speak and have a conversation. Uh, we'll okay. keep the bridge up and we'll keep things going. Uh, okay. Right now, next uh, next who had his hand up was Robert Morningstar, followed by Bill William Belfer, and then Tom from UAP Files at this point. So go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you. And hi, Jack. Hi, yeah. Russ and everybody else and Bruce. Um, I have a couple of comments. One uh, comment on David Adair and then Paul oh. Murad and the third one on gyroscopic achievement of anti-gravity. Yeah. First, I, I know a lot about David Adair, having studied him for about 25 years and heard him. Oh, really? Yeah, and I think that he had the same experience you had of being contacted. Yeah, yeah he did. From the future. Um, yeah. He built a rocket engine that was very impressive at uh, the age of 17. So Curtis LeMay, yeah had him shipped over to Area 51, where he was promptly arrested and kept uh, detained until LeMay went and rescued him. But the important what? thing- Wait, Slow down, slow down. Say that again, say that again, slower. Uh, Curtis LeMay made uh, arrangements for David Adair to go to Area 51 to inspect yeah, that. Yeah, I know that. that engine. But yes. when he was there, the base commander arrested him and put him in the brig and wouldn't let him go. So- Really? I didn't know yeah. that. How long was- yeah. So it was several days because Curtis LeMay actually had to go personally to Area 51 to spring him. The important thing I want to tell you is that David Adair, in this interview he did with Art Bell, revealed 
that he had built this rocket engine using a, a special kind of fuel. And he revealed that the fuel was thorium and deuterium. So that is, um, I thought that was significant. It's the only time that I ever heard him describe the fuel source for his, actually it was kind of fusion engine and thorium and deuterium were what he mixed. Uh, Paul Murad and I uh, were friends and we both had this idea of uh, rotating magnetic fields to achieve anti-gravity. So he built the machine. It just go ahead. Okay, wait, wait, slow down, slow down. So let me make yeah. a few comments. Number one, okay. number one, I'm not questioning whether David Adia's machine actually worked with thorium as a, but has nothing to do with the tic tac. Oh, I didn't say it did. I didn't say yeah, it yeah, okay. Did. So, it's a, so it's a different. There's a different technology. Now the thing is this: there are different time periods. There's many different kinds of extraterrestrials or NHIs. Mm -hmm. And the NHI, you know, the people, whatever, that was contacting him, for some reason, they may have you know, told him how to make the thorium machine, fusion reactor, which sounds a little bit like you know, what they're doing at Lawrence Livermore, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like that one. Um, and they may be you know, maybe important for some purposes. And maybe for maybe for some big star, you know, so, so, yeah, you know, it might, you know, uh, oh yeah, uh, okay. Adir says that that particular device he saw was part of a machine of a big ship that was shot down, mm -hmm. right? It was shot down with the torpedoes and went through the, the damn thing. So uh, that could be a different level of technology. You know, there, there are many different kinds of technologies involved because there are many different time periods. So that could. Uh, uh, so I'm not doubting that. Uh, and um, uh, now there's something that you said, okay, then you said something about, okay, well, continue. continue. Okay, well, the other point was that Paul Murad and I were friends and uh, yeah, yeah. just I'm coincidentally, cool. coincidentally, he, he named his company Morningstar Energy uh, yes, and yes. he was working at Morningstar Energy Box. So I guess that brought us together, but we were both working on rotating magnetic fields and um, I had some success with it. I, I built a a magnetic ring and spun it and the magnetic ring levitated but it exploded from centrifugal forces and I okay found... now, let me let me let me say something about that because i don't want to get too much time okay. on this the tic tacs all these machines do not have you know machines like that rotating magnetic fields mm -hmm. they right. don't have it so uh because it's all like internal so like it's hardly it's all nanoscale it's all very tiny you know maybe they have a little tiny little rotating yeah it could be could be, could be, could be, could be. But the thing is this, that um, I would, actually there is something quite very rare. I would have to see how, uh, even a, on a micro, on a nano scale, and actually there is something, now I remember now, there's something in a book I saw. Uh, you have to show how that little rotating magnetic field via Einstein's gravity equation, how it generates the gravity field. And until I see that, mm -hmm. um, then it, it's not of interest to me. See, it, 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 there are two things. We have, we, we have Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is a very precise equation showing how electromagnetism convert, makes gravity and vice versa. Now there's been recently, there's a new thing by, by uh, Ray Chow, who's a famous physics professor from Berkeley. <clears throat> Has this additional mechanism where it's called the where he uses quantum spin, and he thinks he can he can couple that very strongly to gravitational radiation fields, um, and that you know so, yeah you know, we're right in the middle of working with that, uh, but for so I so uh, but any kind of giant thing like we talk about Murad that might be interesting, but um, it doesn't. It's not directly relevant to the Tic Tac technology. It's not relevant to what I was shown and read into recently by uh, an active military source. It's, so it's not relevant to the uh, military intelligence geopolitical situation that we're in the middle of, right? Right. This, okay. Yeah. Remember, there was this thing that came out where the Congress said that they're afraid that Putin has these new super weapons that mm -hmm. could uh, totally uh, disable our ability for counter strikes. So in other words, if this is true, and now Putin denies it, but of course he would deny it, right? Uh, 
the claim, the, the implication seems to be, and I know people on our side take this seriously, that if Putin wants to, he can destroy Washington, D.C. in a nuclear attack, maybe a small tactical nuke, destroy central Washington, and we will not have any counter retaliatory capability. All right. That's problematic. Okay. Well, now, yeah. Sure. Okay. Now, it, it, this means that with no, no mutual assured destruction anymore. Okay. Right. Now, I don't know if this is true. Or not. I don't know if he has it or it could be psychological warfare. Don't, you know, that's mm -hmm. uh, that, that, it's not that somebody yeah. thing. he knows that. Could, but I have reason to believe, I, I do know that. You know, we know from Hastings, we know from the neutralizing of the nuclear weapons at Hastings, we know that NHI has this capability. Now, listen to this. Just let me give you a scenario here. I don't want to talk about Murad stuff. I don't, about, I don't want to talk about that anymore right. because okay, no problem. Maybe, but it's not. It's not. Oh, oh, okay. It's it's the side issue. Yeah. The technology I'm talking about is of practical importance because we are now on the brink of a nuclear war with with Russia. Do yeah. I don't want to get too in detail. We're on a break, but do it. So everything we're talking about, if we have a nuclear way, it's all over, guys. Things are not stable right now. This is like the Cuba. This is worse than the Cuban Missile Crisis that we're in. So we cannot separate this world we're living in from what we're talking about now, because I'm talking about technology that's very relevant to the military situation. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. 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 okay we're, thanks. We're, thanks a lot, uh, Jack. If we could uh, just jump on here, uh, yeah. William Belfer. Who? Uh, Bill Belfer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, unmute yourself, Bill. Go ahead. Un uh, Bill, you're muted. He's muted, so we can't hear him. Yeah, just keep on unmute. Kenny, that's why if they would type it in chat, then we could just do it that way. See, that would be better than. Uh, it's even harder for me to hear. Yeah. Think, okay. Think right. okay. All right. Uh, well, we have, uh, let's see, okay. one other. Here I am. I'm sorry. Jack, I find this really fascinating. I mean, it will take me a while to digest it all. But you once said that these ETs, particularly, I think the Greys were, were, are, are us. In the future. Did, I, did I uh, well, okay. No, the Greys, no, I think the Greys, the, uh, I think, I don't know, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not Kit Green to do the uh, autopsies and all that, but I think the greys are hybrids. I think they're, uh, they're, they're um, artificial, you know, they're, by, they're, they're um, I think they were made by us, right? They're made by things we're gonna be making, you know, they're manufactured by us in some future time. You know, they're, they're man-made, but they're kind of like, they're conscious robots. You know, they have consciousness, but they're, they're they're like they're partly organic and partly inorganic. They're like what David Adir was talking about. Is it is it possible they they were here before us? No, no. I mean they are here before us because they have time travel. Yeah, I mean we mm -hmm. create a time travel technology, and then yeah, you're able to go back to see Jesus Christ on the cross. Go back, sure. The Garden of Eden. What's the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden is we go say so, you know the, the time travels go back. And they do CRISPR tech genetic engineering on the on the on the primitive gorillas, and they make them into us. It's all look that's a, that's all loop in time. See, you have to well, understand the overcome. What are, what are they doing? What? What are they doing here? Is this an experiment? What are they, are they doing they, here? Yeah, they're what, they, 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 what are they controlling? What are they? Why are they here? Why are they? Here? Well, yeah, oh, it's spe have, speculation at this point. <laughs> First of all, the fact is they're here. They look like they're here. They're here because we're creating it. Okay, do you ever see Star Trek IV? The movies, go see Star Trek IV. That's why they're here. That explains it. And by the way, Paramount Pictures, in the director's cut of Star Trek, that's where, you know, that's where they go back to San Francisco to save the whales. And they go right to the where I used to hang out, the Cafe Trieste in North Beach, they saved the whales, and there's this crazy rocket scientist who's developing warp drive. That character's based on me. They had me lecture on time travel in the director's cut 
on the CD of that movie, Star Trek for Paramount Pictures, hired me to talk about this there. So that's what it is, we're there because we're creating them. It's all a self-consistent loop in time. It's, if, you, if you don't read, if you don't understand Novikov, you have to go to Wikipedia and read the Novikov self-consistency principle, and then you'll understand it. So you got to do your homework. Standard standard physics. This is, this is physics that's been known for like the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, uh, Jack, can you see your uh, the chat uh, the chat chat lines? No, let me see. Uh, let me see if I can see the chat here. I I have to go to more chat. Okay, yeah, I can see now. It's um. Oh, oops, wait, I lost it. Ah, God, I hate this. Oh, what happened? <laughs> okay, I gotta go. You know the. The thing about you want, me, iPads, want me to read them? <laughs> okay. Yeah, wait a second. Let me think about the iPads. That's so easy to, if you hit the wrong part of the screen. Okay, what I'm seeing right now, I see it is mutually assured destruction. Yes. Such a, okay, so where are we at? I'm, I, I, I'm at 5.45. I see 5.45 p.m. Oh, okay. I no, I go, that's going back. Uh, Jack, Jack there's two, there were two hands that were up. If you can just answer those two hands... Um, I can't see the hands. Just tell me what this okay. uh, is. Jose Rodel, uh, Rodel, but there was also Tom, uh, UFO. Okay, okay, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, who, who, uh, am I who is this? Uh, this is Jose. Hi, Jack. Well, Jose, hi, Jose. How are you? Yeah. Um, so can you explain why you say, uh, why you write that all the papers on Alcubierre's uh, warp drive and Atari warp drives and so on in physics journals are ans are correctly answering the wrong question. Can you tell us? <laughs> I don't <what>? like, <laughs> I, if I had a black, if I, if I, yeah, I could, if we could share the screen, can we share the screen so I can go into my, can I draw? I have to, you know, I don't know, people. Oh, maybe too complicated. The whiteboard? The whiteboard? Yeah, I need see if I can find the whiteboard. I, okay, no, I have. I, I can. I can. I'm on my iPad. If you can. Oh wait, share my life. If I do hit the green, share content. Let me see. Can I do this? I just. Yeah, uh, I just you know, executed whiteboard. a whiteboard. Okay. Can I draw, draw on that? Uh, I believe so. I want to see no, no. next. No, no. If I could get into my notepad, I want to share my screen. If I share my screen, I can show it. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I want to Jack, you have to share your whiteboard to do that, sir. Yeah, I, I, I have a, I have a, I want to go. I want, I want you to be able to see my screen. So how do we do it? I say share content, screen. Hang on, a minute. screen. Uh, everything on the screen. Will be recorded. Enable do not. Okay, screen broadcast. Let me see if this. What's happening? Uh, let's see. Uh, there you go. There you go. What you can see? I you can see me. No way. So what's happening now? There can you, go. you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, you can. You can see that. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, I see it now. Okay, so let me go here. Let me go here. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. All right. So, uh, so ask your question again, Jose. So the question is, why is the why are the papers in physics journals that discuss the warp drive, like Alcubierre's, Natarios, and so on, yeah. Yeah. the correct answer to the wrong question? Okay, because so these warp drives, it's like VS, right? That's the. That, can you <laughs> see that picture I just drew? Yes. Okay, so they're, so they're saying there's a guy, there's Alice. Oh, let me draw. Wait, let me, let, me, let me fix this. Okay. So let's see. So we have, uh, uh, we have, uh, this will be Alice. And then we'll have uh, uh, Bob. Okay, and they're seeing the warp drive. They, they each see a metric, right? So they're seeing this thing going and that could be greater than C. Uh, okay. 
that can yeah, be that, uh, this yeah, okay. the, it can be it can be great it can be great in the system, right? The ob the observer uh, views observes a rocket that is going faster than the speed of yeah, light. Yeah, yeah. But but they're seeing but how are they seeing it? They're seeing it with light rays. Right. Light rays, okay. Right. So um <clears throat> so what they're seeing, and then there's you know, there's Einstein's theory. Einstein's theory, I'll say like G mu nu is equal i'll just call it k t mu nu okay but the g mu nu the, the g mu nu they're seeing it's they want to see there's a, like there's a warp field there's some kind of warp field right um and, but actually as you as we well know that warp field is actually i shouldn't i shouldn't do this i shouldn't do this the warp field is really in the fuselage right so yes. this so this is going to be at let me uh let, let me make a new picture let me make a new picture so there is, this is going to be some event on the fuselage, okay, on the fuselage. Uh, this is uh, the fuselage. And I, the, I'm going to just, uh, I should really do space-time diagrams, but I'm not right now. There needs to be a light ray going here, a light ray going there, and this will be Alice. This will be Bob. Okay, and so uh, Alice is going to see a certain metric field from X, Jamie. And Bob is going to see, um, I'll call it G prime, mu prime, B prime, but from the same X. X is this. So, so what this is, but this is an image. It's like optics. This is an image. And this is an image. They're seeing images. And in that image, you know, they're going to have, this metric is going to have something like, uh, uh, it's going to have like one minus, uh, or, you know, what does the metric look like? It's, it's going to, it's with GI, GI, G, G, I'm sorry, hang on. Let me just, their, metric, their metric fields, what looks like the image fields are going to have like a G, um, going to have a, uh, a G, a G, I'll call it TX, which is proportional to VS times some some shape yes. function. Yes, okay, like that, that's that. correct. Yes. Yeah, okay. something like that. Okay. Something yes. Like that. But these are images. This, and then and then what 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 relativity tells you? There's a transformation, a tensor transformation. These are tensor transformations that connect that connect um, what Alice sees. To what Bob sees, and then, as you well know, because you've written now papers on it, Alice and Bob they can each compute what are called tensor uh, curvature invariants. They can compute curvature invariants. So though that there's a certain process, I'll call it. Let's call it a curve. I'll just call it capital C curvature invariant Alice and curvature invariant Bob. But but the point is that they're equal. They're invariant. That in other words even though the details of the data, of the, Im the image data that Alice and Bob sees differ locally, but when they go through the, the machinery, the algorithms of Einstein's general relativity theory, they come up with numbers with which they agree to. So they know this is objective reality. They know it's objective, but they're seeing images. But that has nothing to do necessarily, that has nothing to do with the construction of the machine that's producing these images. This is the source. Okay, let me explain this in a little more detail. See, so what you compute, what everybody's computing, what Alcubierre, what Alcubierre computed is okay in a toy model for this kind of problem. He's, it, what, what Alcubierre is computing are the images, the optical or the electromagnetic images that external observers see when they see what looks like a warp, you know, what looks like a ship that's that's moving like a, you know at warp speed or something like that. But now, what's really happening? What is really happening? What's really happening is that we have to. This is space, and this is time. And here we have. Um, let me just say this is this will be this is this is a particular frame of reference. This is Earth. Let's say here we have Mars. 
Mars. And here we're going to have a ship. We're going to have the warp drive. We're going to have the Tesla. We're going to have Elon Musk's warp drive. It's no more, not a rocket. So what it does, what the, what the, what the machine does, what the machine does is it does something like this. It goes like that. Then it goes like this. Then it goes like that. But so it looks as though to the external observer, it looks as though the machine goes from Earth to Mars instantaneously. But what's really happening, what's really happening is the machine, the gravitational field at the machine itself is represented by these light cone structures. This is one way, this is the Penrose way of doing relativity. Roger Penrose does this. The tipping of the light cones. The tipping of the light is the curvature. The curvature yep. uh, equals, uh, I think they call it, in, in stamp, they call it the tilt, tilt the light cone. Uh -huh. Okay, so inside here, it's like the guy's not moving at all. You know, it's just like this. It's not, and he got yeah, he got this, but he's controlling it with small amounts of energy in here, and there we are. Okay, now the idea is that it's a little, it's a little tricky. So yeah, so this is this is warp drive. It's controlling the ground. It's controlling the local light cone of the ship. So inside the ship, like everything, like nothing's changing. It's like a okay. It's it's actually like a geodesic. The guy they're weightless in here. But now, um, see what I want to say about this. Yeah, okay. So, but here's here's the idea. If this is the ship, if, if this is this is the ship, if this is the ship, this is the metamaterial. It's the metamaterial. And um, this is you know the warp drive, the warp fields, the curve. Yeah, you know, the warp fields are all confined inside here but inside here it's like uh it's free space you know and I'm, I'm using now uh sort of an album sort of the alkyberry idea so the idea is that inside the clocks in here should be remain synchronized with the clocks out there now, this is tricky and this it need not be this way so that when you um when you go here the, the local subjective time here, if the proper time, the proper time is simply the length of this thing, but that could be zero, it turns out, because it's, it, you know, the length, the actual length, it's S is a C, roughly speaking, C squared minus T squared. So you could have X and T not equal to zero, but S is, but S squared, but S squared is equal to zero. It's sort of like a light ray. But the point is this, that if the clocks, if the clocks in the interior of the ship are synchronized to the clocks on the Earth, okay, then you see the actual experience of the guys inside the ship. It'll be like instant, like they just went through like a wormhole or something. They did, they, they uh, at one moment, bang, they were on Earth. The next moment, they're, as far as they're concerned, they're they're they're. Um, they're at Mars, so it didn't take them any time at all. Now it need not be that way. It depends how you design the ship. Now apparently they can do this, but you know, there are you, you can make it any way you want. You can make that the subjective time uh, that there is subjective time here, and it could be you can make it long or short. You can, you can kind of do whatever you want to do, depending on you know on what you want to do. So so that's the basic idea. And um, oh yes, yeah, so let me let me say more. Let me see a little bit more on this. A little bit more. I don't know if I'm losing everybody, but um, that okay. If I have, if I have two, if this is Alice, and this is Bob, yeah, you know, it's just time. Time is vertical and space is horizontal, like before. And if 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 Alice if Alice damn. if Alice says that if Alice wants to see Bob, she has to look at her past light cone. I'm gonna assume space time is flat here. So this is a signal. This is what's called a retarded light signal going from Bob at this event to here. Right? Uh-huh. So and that's also true. 
that's also true in general. Uh, if you if you have outside observers like got people, okay, if you have Commander Fravor who's looking at the Tic Tac, he sees signals in his past light cone, which has to intersect the future light cone of the Tic Tac. In fact, let me let me let me let me change this. Let me let, let me make another picture. Make another picture. Uh, this is this is the F eighteen. This is it, and this is Tic Tac. Tic Tac, and so this command for, this commander forever, right? So, uh, you know, this is this this is space time time. So, the F 18s past light cone has to intersect the future light cone coming from the Tic Tac. So when Fravra sees the Tic Tac, he's seeing his image. This is the source, if you want. Think of the optics. And this is the image. This is what he's seeing. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. And and whatever, Alcubierre, all these guys, they're computing, they're computing the data. Yes. They see that the detectors coming from there. That's what they're computing. Yes. So, all right. So and 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 it'll look like a VS there. So you know, to the image data it, it's going to look like G I zero is you know like VS uh, F of R whatever F of R. It'll look like that. But, yeah. but what's happening here, you know, there may, need not be any 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 relate. I mean, there might be relation, but I'm not. You have to you know look in very detail and you actually do you know do, you know formulate the problem correctly. So um, so what am I saying? Now there's one other in, in, interesting thing here. Let's suppose, let's go back to this situation where the ship does this and does that, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, but look, here, if the light cone is here, this, this is the future light cone of the ship, and but here is an observatory, but you know, just project down here. Okay, but look what's happening here. Here, you have retarded, oh, this is Mars, this is Earth. See, in this situation, <laughs> look at this, in this situation, you have a retarded signal from Mars that's coming back from what looks like the future to uh, this is Alice, let's say. Alice seems, you know, Alice seems to be seeing a a signal from coming backward in time from her future light cone, but it's really a retarded signal from from Mars because the light cones are tipped. See what I'm saying? Yes. So that's kind of, that's kind of weird. That's kind Except of weird. that. Alice is in, in the warp drive now. Yeah, Alice oh. is in warp drive. Okay. So here I have her light cones at right angles to the, the light cones. So she's seeing, but oh, but this is what's important. She's seeing what's ahead of her. See, here's the thing. They make a mistake. That's why I said this. This is why I want this. Is. They make a big mistake in the couple of published literature. That what, there are papers that say, this is, the, see, this is what's important. This is important. They're making a mistake. There are papers that say there's an event to arise. They're saying that you cannot, that Alice in superluminal warp drive will not be able to navigate because there's, she won't be able to see what's in front of her. But that's yes. not actually true. That's not true. That's false. See, because look, let's go back to a regular situation. See, she's seeing, Alice is seeing spatially what's ahead of her, but in the past. But the same thing happens in an ordinary situation. An ordinary situation, I think like this. An ordinary situation, the one I just drew before. This is a future light cone. And this is, see, in an ordinary situation, this is Alice. And even suppose that they're going to so like that, you know, just normally. No, it's not, it's not faster than light anymore. In all situations, when we see what's ahead of us, we're seeing what's ahead of us, but in our past, right? Mm -hmm. But back here, same thing here. She's seeing, Alice is able to see what's in front of her, but in the past, you know, in her past, it's, it's, it's not that different. 
You see what I'm saying? There is, yes. in other words, there's no navigation problem. There's no huh. navigation problem. So you know, and and if the thing is, you know, if the thing is is uh, is close up, she'll see it very much sooner. You know what I'm saying? So so when they say that that you cannot navigate, when they say there's an event horizon, uh, you know, it's fast and superluminal travel. I I think that they're making a mistake there because they haven't really thought it through properly. Now I could be wrong, but this is what this is how it looks to me right now. So. Okay. okay. Now we may have lost that. This maybe is this this may be too complicated for most people. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, Jack, so, yeah. Jack, a quick question. Um, yeah. What you're doing here, you're showing Earth and Mars, and Alice yeah. what she can see in that in that frame. Yeah. yeah. Suppose we expand this out a thousand light years. It we're, doesn't we're, matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Why should it matter? Well, you know, you're going to have to worry about, never mind, I, this is simplified, assuming that there's no gravity here, that'd be, you know, well, no, the gravity, that's localized gravity, just, the gravity is just localized in the warp field of the ship's fuselage, you know, it's very, like, localized, everything out here is ordinary gravity, you know, yeah, but there's no, there's nothing, you know, Earth, I mean, that, this distance is totally arbitrary, it does, you know, it could be halfway across the universe. Okay, well, now, but yeah, then worry about, you know that there's cosmological curvature, all that kind of stuff. You know. Okay. Okay. Now there were two. There were two um, interesting points in two uh, in 2015. They were able to uh, view uh, waves of gravity. Okay, but it was at a higher frequency. And now, just last year, they came up with a different protocol that they used. And they were able yeah, okay, to. That, that, that's interesting, but it doesn't really. That, that's all good. That's good physics. I agree. That's good physics, but it doesn't really relate to the problem here. We want to know how UFOs fly. We want to know how to metric engineer the technology, and uh, gravitational waves are not important. They're only important. Okay, let me explain something. We have what are called near fields and far fields. I should write this down. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Uh, let me just make some field theory. Field theory. Field theory. Field theory. So classical. Can you see this now? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, okay. Yes. Okay. Both have near fields. The waves. Now, warp drive is near field. Near field physics is a little bit different. Now, oh, let me go back. Okay, two separate problems, two separate engineers, two regimes, basically. Near fields like electrical power systems engineering. Jack, you're a microphone. Yep. We can cannot hear, hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, I probably put my hand on the microphone. I don't know what I did. I'm carrying this thing in my hand is the problem because I can't draw it. Uh, I have to hold it in my hand to draw. So the thing is this now, there's two different, you know, there's electrical engineering. We go to PG&E, your, electri your electrical systems, your, your, your cars, most of that stuff, that's near field electrical engineering, right? Your power systems engineering, the, the currents in your house. I mean, the radiation, you know, you don't want to have too much radiation. The, the radiation is kind of, you know, you want to minimize the radiation because it can harm you. Know, when you put your, your cell phone close, well, even that's near field too, but you, you have to worry about microwaves and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so far field weapons, like a laser weapon, right? They're shooting down missiles down with lasers, right? Laser is, uh, is, uh, is uh, light waves, but we could also have a gravity laser. We can have, uh, we can have, uh, uh, 
gravity gravity wave directed energy weapon. weapon as well as light wave okay nhi has this this is operational did you hear what i just said they have this stuff they have this stuff i have and this is again classified but i'm yeah i'm not giving any details and tell what i got but the, this is operational so we don't have does Vladimir Putin have it? Well, uh, I don't know. I've been following my stuff. Who knows what they have? They invited me to Moscow. They might be, I didn't go. They might be, but, but I don't have to go to Moscow because everything I, I do is on the internet. It is public knowledge because I haven't never signed any uh, you know, security <laughs> agreements because it's all stuff that, that I'm doing independently, which is uh, okay. So now look, you can have a you can have a ship. Here's a navy ship. Aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier, okay, in the water. And here comes, here comes, a, they have these underground USOs, underground, right? USO comes up, yeah, shoots a, it shoots a gravity, gravity, gravity weapon. And this is called stressor beam, a stressor beam. And it's a guy named Matt Visser. Matt Visser is in New Zealand. He's a top gravity physicist. He's written papers on this stuff. He's written down the map. He's written the same way that Al Berry writes down a warp drive metric. Visser writes down a metric for this gravity beam weapon. Even as a picture of a, uh, even as a picture of a little green man in a flying saucer squashing, squashing a cow with it. Okay, this is the, the this stressor beam weapon. Except, so what, 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 what will the stressor beam do? The stressor beam is going to create a, uh, a metric tense, a, a gravity uh, Riemann Christoffel tensor, fourth rank tensor field of such strength that it will crumple the steel on the bow of the ship. That's what this thing can do. Okay, that's what the thing can do. And actually, it's done it. I can tell you details. It, this has actually happened. This is this, not science fiction. Somebody has this technology. They've done it to a Navy ship. That's not, I didn't say what Navy. This is real. This is not bullshit. Take it or leave it. You don't have to believe me. You can say I'm Jack is making it up. This is real. Does Vladimir Putin have it? Is that why he's so confident? I don't know. Probably not. You better hope not. <laughs> okay. But we don't know. All right. Let's see what else they, can they do. Not only can do that, they can take a Navy ship and using the gravity beam, they can move it over, say, 400 kilometers. They can take a big ship and sort of like teleport over there. In principle, with this kind of technology, well, well let's call it the S field technology. Okay. So this is what we're talking. We're talking about this is more important than nuclear weapons. Do you understand that? Why is this more important than nuclear weapons? Because you can't use a nuclear weapon on the battlefield, or if you do, you can destroy everything, right? <clears throat> There's no such thing really as a tactical nuke. Well, maybe there is, but if you were use it, if Putin would have exploded an EMP, a small tactical nuke on Kiev to incapacitate them, okay? Or if, suppose Putin would have decided to uh, take a hypersonic missile and do an EMP, small tactical nuke above Washington, D.C., above the Pentagon and totally screw up our... I suppose Putin decides to take out our satellites as... Uh, a bunch of congressmen now have, have said that they can do. Remember, it's just recently about that. Was that just a week ago they were talking about this? Okay. If they do this, if Putin or of us, so maybe we get desperate, maybe NATO, maybe 
What happens? Okay, let me give you a scenario. Let's war game this thing. When I was at Cornell, I was in the Air Force ROTC. They used to give us war games, you know, like Air Force, Air Force intelligence stuff. Okay, this is called war game. So suppose, suppose uh, we're stupid enough. Suppose that uh, Biden is stupid enough, and we start putting troops on the ground in Ukraine because you know Ukraine's losing. Obviously, they're losing. Okay, we can't. Okay, and 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 suppose because the Russian army is so much more powerful than anything NATO can put there. We don't have enough ammunition even, you know. And suppose we, we get our asses beat, which is very like to have. Suppose in two weeks, I'm giving you just a, a worst case scenario, okay? In two weeks, NATO goes into Ukraine, they beat the shit out of our, our forces. And in desperation, Biden, who is senile, decides to, to launch a nuke against Russia. It's the end, right? Then we're a nuclear war, we're all dead. This could happen uh, in two months from now. Say it happens three months from now. Okay. So hopefully it's not going to happen. Hopefully that the people around Biden, uh, well, who knows? <laughs> they seem kind of crazy to me. But uh, in any case, let's suppose that doesn't happen. But with this gravitational technology, it's surgical. You could use it on a small scale and there's no radiation. Well, then, you know, if you get too close, it's radiation sickness, the kind of stuff that... Uh, that uh, Gary Nolan is, is, is studying, you know, kick green. Okay. So there we are. Okay. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I think I may have said enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I think we have a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, comments. Uh, All right. One here from Christy Green. I'm going to work backwards. Go ahead. And uh, she said, so we have the metamaterials are conscious and yes. are the creation of the non-human intelligence. Can yes. the individual non-human intelligence function independently in a similar way? Example, yeah, sure. could, a, could a gray do something like this outside of the UAP, just thinking out loud? Well, I'm not sure what the question means, but I think the answer is yes. I mean, the question is kind of vague. Again, it's not well posed. She's saying, yeah, I mean, well, well let's put it this way. Suppose we have a drone. So a, a conscious, a conscious AI killer drone. Can it take independent? Yeah, well, even right now, even now we, we have unconscious AI. We have unconscious AI drones that that can that can uh, that can uh, make independent decisions based on on new information that comes in. So there's basically no difference between a conscious AI, if it has suitable input sensors and output motor mechanisms like we have, then it's the same mechanism as us. It's like gravity. It's a, uni it's a universal phenomenon. Uh, con consciousness, consciousness as a physics phenomena is the reaction of uh, matter on quantum waves, on quantum waves. In the sense of bone, in the sense of bone, the bone pilot wave theory, pilot wave theory. This is, this is, and, 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 you know, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, but that's conscious and gra the same way that gravity equals reaction. Of matter on uh, uh, on on, on space-time. That's Einstein. And both the common idea, the, the uh, what's called the general action-reaction principle. And if you go, okay, I can't read. Uh, that's that. And if and if you go to I can't uh, Pavo I don't know how to spell Pavo's last name, Pavo, so like P P Pilkin uh, uh, Pilkin, um, section seven, uh, brain as a quantum measuring device. He explains that. Just go on Google. It comes right up. 
Yeah, it, you know, it's a paper he wrote. Okay. All right. Does that does that answer? Yeah. Um, uh, Christy, did that uh, did that do it? I have one new message here. Okay. Conscious. Yes. Yeah, I was just saying thank you. I, I was just kind of throwing some thoughts out there, but thank you. Okay. Okay, I have a question here. It says, if metamaterials are engineered so that the stress energy tensor has G to C of four, and C yeah, gets... It's, it's, okay, let me write. It's G mu nu is eight pi G over C to the fourth times T mu nu. Okay. Yeah. And C gets small enough. How is the gravity generated able to escape metamaterials to the outside to do useful movement of the vehicle? Well, the, 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 the question is, is jumbled. Look, it's very simple. It's just mathematics. I'm being oversimplifying now. There's all kinds of things. If C, if C goes to zero, okay, then eight pi, eight pi G over C to the fourth goes to infinity, just mathematically. Let me just try this a little. But this is the gravity field. This is constant or fixed. I should say fixed. Fixed. That is, we have a certain design. In order to perform a certain flight characteristic, we need a certain G mu nu field. So we keep that's what we need. So we, you know, the computer is, is calculating all this. So we keep that fixed, but we're making the effect of C small. Okay, so that means as 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 this as this number gets big, this number goes small. So T mu nu is going to zero. To, it's the same equation. It's a hyperbolic, it's the equation of a hyperbole. Let me do it like this. So Einstein's equation is basically Z equals XY. Okay. So if you plot X versus Y, different values of Z, Z it's the equation of a hyperbole, different, you know. So that's all that's going on. This is Einstein, this is GR. The trick is to make X big for fixed Z. You want Z fixed. Z is Z is you have a desired gravitational field configuration at a certain moment in time, let's say, you know, in the rest frame of, of the craft. All right. And you want to do that with a small amount of energy. So if you make if you if you can make the coupling X coefficient as big as you like. And there's a way of doing that because we see them actually doing it. Then you're invisible; you're home free. So now, now if you, <clears throat> this, anyone with basic understanding of mathematics, you know, from a uh, high school level, you know, first year college, should be able to follow this argument. If you cannot follow this, I don't know how to make it any simpler. But this is like, this is like baby steps. This is like. Uh, Kindergarten stuff for, you know, for physicists and engineers should be. To, that's the basic idea. Of warp drive is very simple, but the problem is that um, whenever you look at a general relativity book, they always take C equal one. You see, and sometimes they'll write they'll only write in the in the, in the textbooks write G mu nu is equal to eight pi G T mu nu. And unless you're an engineer and you look at it closely, you don't even know that C is there. <laughs> See. And sometimes they even don't even do that. Sometimes they said they also they like to be fancy mathematicians. They like to be elegant. Well, when you're doing when you're doing elegance, you sometimes lose a lot of the you throw the baby out with the bathwater. So sometimes you see a bunch of textbooks and they write eight pi team. <laughs> you don't even see the G there. 
And that's been the, that's why people, you know, this is hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. Do they do that intentionally? Well, now, uh, if you want to be a conspiracy kook like me, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, it wasn't. You know who says that? Actually, it's Eric Weinstein, right? <laughs> Eric Weinstein says that. Eric, Eric Weinstein is a conspiracy kook. <laughs> no, for real, conspiracy kook. Because he says in various, he does various video podcasts and he points out the 1956 or so Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill conference uh, with with um, Bryce DeWitt, who I knew, by the way, I knew Bryce DeWitt, Bryce DeWitt. And they had, you know, uh, they had the, what's his name's dad, you know, Witten, Louis Witten, Louis Witten. Yes. And, and, and Wheeler, you know, I, I, these were some I, I knew Wheeler very well. And they had all this anti-gravity meeting, anti-gravity, anti-gravity, 1957. That's when I was at Cornell, actually. I was already an undergraduate at Cornell at this time. And um, <laughs> and they're saying that maybe they conspired to, to keep the secret. So if you believe, so actually, if you're a conspiracy theorist like Eric Weinstein, <laughs> And I think what's his name? Uh, the guy who works with Weinstein. They, they, all these guys work with Peter Thiel. Peter, is it Peter Thiel? Thiel. Yeah, Thiel, the billionaire. You know, they they, mm -hmm. they 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 tell Peter Thiel how to invest his money in stupid projects like 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 rockets. You know, like 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 Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. They're all dumb. They're all a bunch of dummies. Elon, okay, so Elon Musk. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Bezos, and who's that? And Peter Thiel, smart uh, Peter Thiel, uh, Thiel. I can't. They're all intelligent fools. <laughs> Einstein, intelligent and, fools, and very wealthy. <laughs> and who? And very wealthy. Yeah, well, you could be. No, look, they're, 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 these are all smart, genius guys in the field. But I mean. You know, but they're making a mistake. They're putting millions of dollars into rockets, which is obsolete technology, because you know, um, pride, pride goeth before the fall. It's a human characteristic. And Elon Musk, who is a genius, I agree with Elon Musk on many things. Elon Musk says there's no evidence for UFOs, no evidence for warp drive. Well, he's a dumb schmuck about that because there's plenty of evidence. <laughs> he hasn't looked hard enough. Hey, Jack, Jack, Robert Morning, Morningstar has a question for you. Do you see a relationship between consciousness and soul? And what? Soul, S-O-U-L. S -O -U -L. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing. Conscious. What's the difference? What's the difference? The soul, uh, I mean, the soul is just... Pattern, the pattern, the pattern of memories, memories, you know, is uh, it's the soul. What else is it? Now, can it exist beyond death of the body? Yeah, sure. In principle, yes, it can. Of course, it can. That's the whole thing. That's the whole, you know, you know we're talking about here's a body. Uh, and here is a uh, mind field, quantum quantum mind field, and um, <clears throat> you know it's a it's a physical field, it's a pilot pilot field, pilot pilot wave. It's it's a giant it's a giant pilot pilot wave field. Bohmian, this is Bohmian Bohmian quantum. It's a physical field, like electromagnetic. It's a little bit different, has different properties, but yeah, you could you can take. Uh, you can you can uh, you can have a cloud, and here here's here's a body, and upload, upload. In fact, that's what David Adir said happened to him, right? David Adir, if he's telling the truth, let's assume he is for the time being. David Adir, 
right? David Deere, 1971, at area 51. Uh, here's the the concha, he, here's the machine UFO. Here's David. David and the UFO. You know what happens? He goes. Did you did you did you watch that thing? He goes into the interior of the UFO. He sits down in the seat, like what sort of like what Colonel Corso talks about. He sits down in the seat. He puts his hands on a console, and this nanotech. It's like this thing. You know the nanotech, like the nanobots come out and they grab his fingers. They grab his fingers, right, like a glove. Like this liquid metal comes out and grabs the fingers of a glove, and the conscious, the conscious AI that's in the machine has a female personality. She says, "Sounds like Lauren Bacall, right?" <laughs> Lauren Bacall. And it says, and it says, "I'm uploading, I'm uploading," and it starts tingling. Like he said, "Oh, you know," she transfers the machine. The conscious transfers her memories or consciousness, the soul, if you know. But so and it goes into his body. So he's now two people. Yeah. He's now two people. He has this alien consciousness, a female, inside him at the age of 17, 1971, ever since. That's what he's claiming. He claims this, okay, if you look at the video. But there's nothing he's saying there that violates quantum mechanics as I understand it. This is all possible, this is all technology. This is all NHI tech, advanced tech, yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> as soon as Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, as soon as they realize this, they, they want to they don't want to die, they want to live forever. Transcendence, like the movie Transcendence. You know, PK Dick. PK Dick Vellis. This is all real. Uploading. This is all Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow is a schmuck. <laughs> A schmuck. What a schmuck is Bigelow. Bigelow spends all his money on these flakes, you know, to life after death. And he's talking to these idiots don't know anything. He should be talking to me, the schmuck. <laughs> They're all a bunch of schmucks. No, I'm serious. I'm sorry to say, but it's true. Have I'm you tried smart. marketing yourself to him? What? <laughs> Have you tried marketing yourself? to him to Bigelow they know because they don't want to talk to me I'm I, I, marketing myself to that's like that's that's like saying uh that's like having uh Donald Trump talk to Nancy Pelosi <laughs> you know <laughs> that's because they, they talk to guys like Colonel John Alexander and Eric Davis you know, all these guys who have uh, conned money out of him and there, you know, this is this gets back to the whole uh, uh, CIA Pandolfi thing that the, the crooks and the loons around Bigelow and around um, allegedly around, I guess, being brand a bunch of people that they've conned all this money, you know, out of uh, these guys with these false promises and lousy bad physics, yeah. and that's why they're trying to keep me like I don't exist. That's why uh, Gary Nolan and Sol didn't invite me because. All these guys from Bigelow were there, giving their bullshit, giving their talks of bullshit. Yeah, you know, Colonel Alexander gave a stupid talk. God knows what. He's the guy who uh, makes Joe Biden look like a genius. <laughs> Jack, what about uh, Skinwalker Ranch? Where where they're at with Skinwalker Ranch? It's, it's real. <laughs> Skinwalker yeah. Ranch is real. I tell you all, I know all kinds of things about Skinwalker Ranch, mm -hmm. going back twenty years ago. Uh, do you th are they are they breaking new ground right now? I mean, it seems like they no, are, but well, well, the okay, television. I I, listen, I uh, I know Travis Taylor. He's he's a, he's a, he's a, he's, a, he's a good guy. He's good for this. And yeah, there are things happening at at tra at, uh, at Skinwalker Ranch uh, that have been happening for a long time. And yeah, I think what they're saying, you know, there are uh, non there are uh, ETs up there. You know, the whole skinwalker thing, that's a form of, uh, you know, NHI. And they, it looks as though they have some kind of cloaked um, device, like a Tic Tac that's hovering, that, that they've gotten sick from the anti-gravity blue shift. And Travis Taylor himself says he got he got a mild radiation sickness because he was standing under this, this cloaked thing at about a thousand feet up. 
that they're detecting. Yeah, so it's all real. I, I think that's basically all real. Well, what do you think they're going to find if they can get in under the under the mesa, you know, the, to the dome? Well, I don't know. I, I, metamaterials, I, I, they're I, finding I, metamaterials listen, and all I, types of things. Listen, I'm not an expert. I actually have not, I've only watched maybe uh, a whole, an hour of the whole Skinwalker series, okay? <clears throat> I don't follow because I'm busy with my own stuff <clears throat> and I don't have to be convinced that there's something there. I know there's something there because I also have information from that, from 2004 when Bigelow owned it and there was Jacques Vallée and there's this crazy French woman. You know, it's a whole story. I don't want to go into it. Actually, Gary Beckett wrote a, writes about it. If you look back and you'll see about me and Skinwalker Ranch and Bigelow and Ron Benz, all these, all Kit Green, all these guys. And about there were people maybe killed that people got injured and Bigelow even talks about the people who got injured. There was a, a battle, it's like a battle, but you know, there's like the Bigfoot ET that comes out of the damn wormhole. Eric Davis himself with Jacques Lallet, they wrote this paper, High Strangers, where they talk about the Bigfoot type gorilla, this black monster comes out of the damn wormhole, you know, and they, you know, you know it, it's that kind of thing. So there's all these stories. It's not just me, it's, it's them talking. And I, I think there's something to it. There's two, you know, so, uh, and I don't know what they're going to find underneath it. If you believe David Adir, maybe they'll find another, another laboratory under Who the hell knows? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I haven't been there. I don't want to go there. You know, oh, it's, really? too far, <laughs> it's too far from London. It's too far from my, my club in London. It's too, far, <laughs> it's too far from the Italian cafes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to go there. I'm, you know, but, but somebody... Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I don't know. Well, first, oh, uh, let's see. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any more comments here. Uh, yeah. Thank you for meeting everyone. Hope you all have a wonderful evening and day. Thank you for your time. Jack, oh, see you ending? next time. That was uh, from, uh, yeah, Angie uh, Ongea. Anjali uh, Ongea. I don't know. Does anybody have an important question? The detail. An uh, are there any intelligent questions left? <laughs> Jack, would you be willing to uh, speak in front of Congress and share some of these thoughts with Congress and put it out of there? Course they would, not interested? Too, of course they would, but they're too stupid to invite me. Would I be willing to? That, that Moscow invited me, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, of course. Thank they're you. too dumb, though. And they have people advising them that say, stay away from Sarfati because they're afraid I'll expose their ignorance. <laughs> My go, go ahead and stop sharing your uh, <clears throat> your whiteboard and I'll put up some other graphics that people might be. Okay, let me with. see. Where, where, how do I stop sharing it? Now, how do, how, oh, how here. do I, oh, I have to go. I don't know how to do that. Oh, stop. Okay, stop. There we That's go. Nice. Okay. Did it stop? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so how do I get back into here? So what happened? All right, okay, yes, all right, go ahead. Is that a deer? Who's that? Oh yeah, a deer, a deer. Yeah, David yes. a deer. Yeah. He's overweight, he needs to lose some weight. No wonder he had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Rons, What's all these guys that get so fat? Yeah, and see, let's see. There is, uh, we have other folks out here. Nick Colonel, Mindy uh, Gerber. Still have a good crowd. They're, they're hardcore. They're hanging on. <laughs> okay, okay. They're hanging on to every word you're saying, Jack. Oh, oh, there, oh. there is a question from the audience asking, yeah. "What is the source of the energy?" And What's that, what? What? What is the source of the energy? What is the source? I don't know. Maybe it's a triple A battery. It's a it's an yeah. energizer money battery. What's the cost of that? It depends. How am I supposed to know that? See, those are inappropriate. Those are questions from people who don't understand how science and engineering work. They don't understand the difference between between physics and engineering. They're asking a detailed technology question, which. Uh, who cares? How, I mean, obviously, not a lot of energy. It's all, all kinds of sources of energy. What happened? Can you hear me? Yeah, the, the, yes. dipl the diplomatic answer is that Jack 
shows that the energy required is quite small. Like he says, right. it could be, according to Jack, it could just be a few batteries. Yeah. So, so it, according to Jack, you do not require a huge source of energy. Yes. That is, that is Jack's point. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And the point is, well, it's more than that, not just theory, because we see from observations from the U.S. Navy reports and other reports that, you know, from all the data they have, that these things are flying around. And obviously they're not, by conventional propulsion, they would have to be emitting huge heat signatures. They would, you know, huge disruptions in the atmosphere, and they're not doing that. So that there needs a small amount of energy. We know that empirically. That's a fact of observation. Now, exactly how they do that technologically, that's the $64 trillion question. Jack, Jack to, you, to, to use several points, portals, uh, wormholes, uh, I'm assuming yeah. that we're talking about things with similar capabilities. Yeah. Are there more than, how many do you think there are and where do you think they might well, be how many besides what? Skinwalker maybe? I'm sorry, what? Uh, the portals, uh, uh, what? wormholes, what, what whatever them? the, yeah, from a physics standpoint, um, you know, Einsteinian uh, physics, I guess, uh, the, the wormhole is not anything new. It's just, no. uh, I guess, uh, how so many do the you question? think there are? Or maybe, how many do I think they are? How that we know of. I mean, that, that are maybe manifesting themselves right now. Well, you're asking me, um, uh, why ask me that question? Why is that important? There's more um, than one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, how many there are. I mean, they haven't told me. I mean, uh, I ask you, has I, ha, have I been contacted and they told me how many they have? I don't know. No. And by the way, in general, what I can say in general is that the physics behind this stuff is so elementary that any intelligent civilization in the universe is going to discover it, okay? And how many are out there? So, yeah, it's probably billions and billions of them. It's a big universe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Jack. 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 If it's so easy, you should stay away from Russia. Stay away from, who said? Well, this I'm not going to Russia this now. Russ Targ. If this is so I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not sure about that. Keep your physical Tucker body away, away from wait, the Soviet Union. Tucker Carlson was just in Moscow. He says Moscow is a beautiful city. Everybody's doing well. The economy's doing well. There are no homeless and no bums. There's no crime. It sounds compared to New York City, which is being overrun, compared to San Francisco, where they shit in the street and you can't do anything about it. I don't know. Maybe I'll go to Moscow. <laughs> That's because the troublemakers have already disappeared. What's that? They what? The troublemakers in Russia have already disappeared. I'm sorry. They're making what disappear? No, I here. Travel maker. He's referring to Novotny. Okay. Okay. You want, okay. We don't want to get the power. The first of all, that's all bullshit. You know, Navalny. Navalny was a CIA. Um, MI6 agent. He was a traitor to Russia. He was created by this guy, McFall, Mike McFall, I call him McFowl, who was, a, I think, ambassador to Russia. You know, he's a neocon on our side. Uh, they sent him, they said, get this now. I happen to know a lot about this since we're, you know, since you brought it up. They sent him to Yale about 23 years ago, about 1990. He was sent to Yale for CIA training, how to be a spy. You know, how to, and he never had, he never had uh, a big following in Russia. The most he ever got was when he ran for mayor of Moscow. I know a lot about this shit. He, he ran for mayor of Moscow, maybe two, five percent of the vote. That's it. He was no danger. Yeah, you know, he, he was. He's not. And he's a goddamn Nazi. He hated. He's Islamic. He he said Muslims are cockroaches. Okay, he's not a good guy. Plus, wait, let me finish. Plus, his his mother, Navalny's mother, just yesterday, came out and started yelling about his wife. He said he said, she said the Navalny's mother, Navalny, says the wife is a gold digger, married him, 
and and has been screwing around with other guys. Okay, he's been and and it was his wife who told him to leave Germany and go back to Russia, knowing that they would put him in jail. Okay, so the whole thing is so great, and she just happened to be at the Munich Security Conference the very day he dies. That's no coincidence. Now, the Ukrainian intelligence itself has just come out today, in fact, and said he died of a blood clot. Putin did not murder him. Why should Putin kill Navalny on the very day that a Defka falls to the victorious Russian army in a great victory? For the same reason that, you know, when Prigozhin's airplane went down, it went down a day that Putin was supposed to give its great talk and some, you know, great thing. So the point is this, these are, uh, it's, it, if if uh, if Prigozhin and if uh, Navalny were actually killed, they were killed by our guys. They were killed by agents of the Ukrainians in there to embarrass, to frame Putin, to make it look like Putin did right. it. Because the stupid guys like you, I'm sorry, Russ, I love you, but you're dumb about <laughs> when it comes about politics. You don't know what the shit you're talking about. Okay? You don't know what the facts are. You don't know what the truth is. And what about the guy Galiti who died in the Kiev prison? And what about the 1,200 people from January 6th? A lot of them, you know, didn't do anything violent. And they're in prison. So when we, you know, the United States today is has no moral superiority over Russia. Okay, that's just bullshit. And I'm an American patriot. I'm not. I'm not. Oh no, agent to Putin. Tra um, a Tucker Carlson, me, and other guys. We're American patriots. Mm -hmm. I grew up. You know, I remember World War II. My uncle was in Guadalcanal. You know, four years in combat. Yeah, you know, I was. Yeah, I was in the ROTC, I was in the Civil Air Patrol, but I'm an intelligent man and I've studied the situation and everything you read just about, you know, Trump is right. It's fake news. You cannot trust anything from the New York Times about Ukraine. You cannot trust anything in the Washington Post about Ukraine. You cannot trust anything on mainstream media. It's all bullshit. You cannot trust. And because I've, I've been actually tracking this with intelligence people. You know, I've been actually doing my homework on this. And we're living in a 1984 situation where, you, you know, people, you know, you, you believe, I mean, you're just brain, you believe a bunch of sh bullshit. The narrative, the narrative that's being told about Ukraine is completely false. It's like you're living in George Orwell's 1984, the Ministry of Truth, the propaganda thing, and it's being amplified by the social networks. And that's a damn fact. We're no longer living in a free country in the United States of America. We're living in a banana republic. All right. All and all right. Now, okay. Now, I didn't want to get into this political thing, <laughs> but but you know, so uh, so we're in a very serious situation here, which well, can lead us to a nuclear war. We're all dead. When Unless, I was in Russia, I couldn't get more than two feet from the guys who were following us. Well, so what? That's that bad? Why is that bad? That's good. The it's also bad, it's bad if you want to have a rival day. It's yeah, but so what? You were there. When were you there? Russ, when were you there? What, what year were you there? What year was that? 83 and 84. Oh, oh yeah, I've got well, so, yeah, so good. Russ, what's wrong with you? You must be, Russ, you're skinny. You're 90 years old. You're a little bit senile. Now, in 83, that's the Soviet Union. Today, Russia is not the Soviet Union. You're no longer in the Soviet Union. So you think things are much better? This is now. 2024. It's not 1983 anymore. Of course. And now, <laughs> I mean, you know, so what? Logic. Where's your logic? Judgment. Okay. Russia Jack. today. Jack. Listen, Russia, I'm not saying I'm not saying that's a screamer. Look, Russia is a czarist, it's an authoritarian state, but so is the United States. Yeah. So is the United States today. Look what they're doing to Trump. We've weaponized, it's called lawfare. We've weaponized the, the FBI. We've weaponized the Department of Justice. They may come and get me and take me and put me in fucking uh, Leavenworth for, 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 for speaking what I think, for exercising my constitutional First Amendment rights. Okay? And yeah, we live in a Here different world are. today. Yeah. What's that? We live in a different world. Our country is not what it yeah, was. Uh, well, we're, we're living, we're, we, 
yeah, yeah, we're living in a dictatorship today. They're saying that Trump is going to end democracy. The goddamn Democrats and the rhinos, they've already done it. But we're so fucking stupid and brainwashed, you don't see what's <laughs> happening right in front of your nose. Now, Jack, don't <laughs> hold back. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's what, I mean, you know, I, okay. I mean, just look what's happening. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Hey, yeah, Jack, I, I wanted to ask you a question about... Yeah, uh, I just, I to just was trying to yeah. say, take care of yourself. What? I didn't realize... Going back to physics. It's going to be uh, controversial. Yeah, let's go back to physics. <laughs> well, they're connected, though. They're connected. Yeah. They're connected. The, one, the one thing we haven't heard, the one word we haven't heard at all during these conversations is the Higgs field. And I'm wondering if this energy... Forget the Higgs is, field. It's not important. The reason you haven't heard about it is not important. It's important to start... Okay. The Higgs field itself is high energy physics. Right. Okay. Not important. What we have in metric is low energy physics at the opposite end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there is an analogy to the Higgs field called the Froilich condensate, macro, you know, and spontaneous symmetry by the golden. There is a kind of what's analogous to the Higgs field, low energy condensed matter physics. And that has to do with superconductivity and room temperature superconductivity. And that is, I think, relevant to metric engineering. But the Higgs field itself is not. The Higgs field itself, you know, it's at many powers of 10 energy scale. That, you know, it, it, it's a different the source. Couldn't that be what? the source? Couldn't that be the source of the energy because of the rotation? No, the because it shows. No, 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 because it shows you don't understand basic physics. Okay, if you ask such a question, you're so ignorant of the way theoretical physics really works. You don't understand number. You don't understand scale. The Higgs field as a mathematical concept of the idea of symmetry breaking does have some relevance, but not the Higgs. The Higgs field determines the rest masses of the quarks and of the W mesons at GeV, at billions of electron volts. Okay, our stuff is only happening at like an electron volt, billion times, maybe even a 40th electron, the 40th electron volt, or maybe even smaller than that. Okay? Yeah. So, and you can't change, and if you read Lenny Susskind, uh, The Black Hole War, He'll explain to you, you can't change the Higgs very much. If you change it, you destroy the universe. It's not the Higgs field. Anybody says the Higgs field, but they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're just spouting off half cock. You know, it's like any physicist hears that right away. They're going to think you're a nutcase. You know, get it. You know. Well, don't, don't you walk think walk. the CERN tampering with it could result? No, no. Forget that. that that's all. Yeah, really, if they make a black hole. Well, I was wondering if... if the, even if they make a black hole at CERN, it's going to be a little black hole. And by Hawking radiation, it's going to radiate. So all this stuff, these are all stupid people who don't know. And they're, they're, they're pseudo physicists. They don't understand physics well enough. And they're just misleading people. OK, so almost everything you see on the Internet, it's mostly bullshit. Thanks. Like Thanks. OK, next, next. Question right, next, about next, physics. Next, next, next question. If you want your head chopped off, <laughs> <laughs> this, this I got my tin question. pot, my my flag jacket. I'm, I'm covered. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Here's okay. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, we still have a bunch of people out there. We got some right, cards. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're going. I only see 21 people. Are there more? Well, well, there were, well, well, we did have about 45, I think. So we yeah, still got the hard one left. There. The 20 now, left. Like, Kurt, are, you, are you awake? I, 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 I've scared away at least 25 of them. They, they, <laughs> they, 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 they had to leave to find a face, to find a safe space before they melt. Uh, they're, they're hardcore, Jack. They're hardcore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. I, let's see. Who out there? I, I see Karen Wallows out there. Kathy Graves yeah. is out there. Kim Erickson, Mindy Gerber. Oh, have... Come on, don't be bashful. Jack won't take your head off. Well, he might. Well, but that's not... <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a question. Okay, yeah. go. Uh, remote remote viewing. Uh, there's a question yes. I've always wanted to know, and and the question is this: When someone is remote viewing. How do they possibly 
what should I say, position themselves to what they want to view. Because you could be around the subject, you could be on top of the subject, you could be very far off. What do they, how do they gauge that? So what they're trying to remote view is in a reasonable uh, position to, to their their mind, their thinking, their, their viewing. Okay, well, I don't really understand your question, but I'm not an expert on remote viewing, and Russell Targ is. Well, there I can say the I physics of remote viewing. The, the remote, view, the the physics remote of viewer viewing. will position himself so that he gets something understandable to see. Now, if, if you sh if you can come back to my 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 office here, here I am. Yeah, see, the, you see that you can probably see on the wall the picture of an airport. See, can people see a runway there? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Right under that runway is a pencil drawing that looks exactly like the runway. And one day our great psychic Pat Price did not show up. So I had to do a remote viewing in his in his place. And I just sat there and said, I don't know where hell's in South America somewhere. And I see a airport I an an airport on an island, and there's a runway on the left side and the airport building on the right side. And my drawing looks as though I was drawing it from the photograph. So I, I don't know how that happened, but it's an answer to your question. When you, when somebody asks you to describe where Joe is hiding, you close your eyes and you see whatever appears. And in this case, I made a drawing this is a quite remarkable copy of what the place looks like. And while I was doing that, nobody in California had any idea where he was. So remote viewing is, is quite easy to do, and it's often excellent rendition. Thank you so much. That does help me. Russell, is that the norm or is that an exception? When, when you're doing this, you know, well, I was not, I was for, forbidden to take part in remote viewing experiments. So they didn't want us mix up the researchers with the viewers. So this was the only time that I ever took part in a remote viewing. And it's because it was a series where hell was in South America and Pat Price was, as it happened, he was hired away by the CIA who didn't want him lo loose with us but they hired Pat Price, the great psychic, to come to Washington and work for the CIA. And then he mysteriously died a couple of months later. Yeah, he was murdered, wasn't he? That's he was my, opinion. My, my opinion is that Price was murdered. Yeah, I think so, too. By the way, you know about Harold Chipman. Harold Chipman and, and Pat Price were partners, you know. And they, they Harold Chipman uh, ran a... Uh, a CIA operation in Oakland with Pat Price before Pat Price came to SRI. This is what Hal, Hal told me personally. And Hal, by the way, it's interesting, Hal was killed. Hal, I, I, Harold Chipman was also murdered. Both of them were. Well, Pat Price was, Both a, of them problem. Were. Pat Price was a problem for the CIA because he was a uh, freewheeling psychic who would look into their office and read what was on the desk. And in, in making my film, Third Eye Spies, Ken Crest told me yeah. they were very nervous about Price being uh, run, just running around California looking into anything he wanted to look into. Yeah, but wait a minute, but wait a minute. That's interesting information. But I happen to know from Harold Chipman Harold Chipman was a top C. Harold Chipman was station chief of CIA in Germany at some at one point, and was involved. This is back, I think, in the seventies, uh, maybe. <clears throat> no, no, no. But when did I meet him? Let's see. I met him in the. I guess it was I met him in the early eighties, so maybe the sixties. Uh, Chipman was, you know, was a major CIA guy, and he was a close associate of, of Pat Price. It was well. You met Chipman. Yes, I did. You, you, yeah, you met him, and um, and and so uh, you know, I mean, Chipman was CIA. So you think Chipman killed Pat Price's friend? <laughs> they were, 
I don't when, think so. I'll tell you what I think is that when Pat Price got to Washington, he was yeah. doing operational things for CIA. Yeah. And they got yeah. very nervous about him because it's as though Superman is a remote yeah. tour. Because what yeah. they discovered, you gotta let me finish one sentence. They yeah. discovered that every day Pat Price, who's an enthusiastic Scientologist, would yeah. do the remote viewing for Ken Kress and then phone up the Scientology group and tell his chaplain what they had done and where they were looking. So so he had a whole notebook of top secret information that the CIA eventually discovered at the Scientology office when they were investigated for taxes. So I, I learned from Ken Kress that weeks and weeks worth of his interrogations with Pat Price had been handed over to Scientology. And that made a big problem for the CIA. What yeah. do you do with this guy who can see anywhere in the world and is a spy for the Scientology? So well, if he was doing it for Scientology, could he have been doing it for somebody else? Could have been. It sounds like he was out of control. <clears throat> I mean, he... I'm sure he was uh, well. Yeah, but 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 I don't think he, I don't think there was any issue of Pat Price working for the Russians. No, he was a yeah. high level Scientologist. But the Scientologist, I didn't realize Pat Price was a Scientologist. I thought Ingo Swan was a Scientologist. Also, huh. Ingo Swan. Well, you know, but Ingo you know, Swan you know helped. Oh, everybody there was a Scientologist except me and Hilla Hammond. Well, you know that. Um, <laughs> That you know that L. Ron Hubbard was involved with uh, Jack Parsons and with uh, Arthur Young, who was involved with us, right? Yeah. I mean, we're very. So that whole that whole. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard was wasn't he in the OSS in World War Two? I mean, he was a uh, wasn't he a Navy uh, in the U.S. Navy? Well, he was a science fiction writer, and they... yeah, well, like that was later, but I mean, during the war. I don't know what else he was doing. Okay. He, spent, he spent a lot of time with this fake religion. Yeah. Like, uh, hundreds of thousands well, of he, people. Yeah, he went there. Yeah, he, he was like, he was like, we're the air. Yeah, it was a cult leader. You know, That's we were, right. We were, we're, <laughs> all right. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> any other oh, this questions? is a great conversation. How long yeah. do you guys want to go on? <laughs> well, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm... It, to, what we to, said in the film <laughs> is it's very hard to know what you do when your great psychic turns out to be a double agent. Yeah, that's you, scary. You, you, you got this guy working for you who can look anywhere in the CIA, and the CIA is all about secrets, and suddenly you got this guy who can see anything in the world, and you're working, and you're working with him. I mean, he, he's sort of like... Well, super, I, are you saying sorry. Pat Price? Are you saying Pat Price was better than Ingo Swan? We don't have any data for Ingo. Ingo Swan didn't like to be tested. There, there are many people as good as Pat Price. Joe McMonagall is as good as Pat Price. And Hella Hammond, who I brought in as a control subject, because she's very intelligent and very charming, and I liked her, and she thought it would be amusing to be a psychic subject for the CIA. I mean, she was a woman of the world, and it turned out in formal experiments published in Nature magazine, Hella did better than Pat Price. Oh. Hella's formal evaluation is one in a million. Pat Price was like one in a hundred thousand. Mm, okay, interesting. So the only thing I can say is a physicist. Just let me <clears throat> let me summarize. One thing I can say is this: that we understand the basic principles in terms of quantum mechanics how remotely it works that does not mean i understand detailed things of how the brain and how people actually do it see there's a very different level the but thing it doesn't bother me when it doesn't we know, bother me. It's a we know for a fact that i could leave you with yeah. we did we did 20 years worth of remote viewing we know for a fact that the accuracy and reliability of remote viewing is independent of distance and independent yeah. of time. Well, that's time, that's time, quantum. Time and distance do not matter. Yes, that's understood. 
That's what I'm saying. Quantum mechanics, physics explains that. That, that, those, what you just said is not a mystery at all. It is exactly what we expect from the quantum theory. Okay. okay here, here's, a 64, here's a sixty-four thousand dollar question for you. With all that, that effort, with, with all the, with all that effort on the remote viewing end, and how successful it is, how much effort have they put in on countermeasures for that? I mean, or uh, not? Yeah, I don't expect you to answer that. I'm sure it's highly classified, but it seems to me that there'd be a, a, a vital area that they somebody would be looking at. Well, electromagnetic shielding does not help. It does not, cover, the quantum... not cover, he, People <laughs> like to be in a shielded room or, or in a submerged submarine. I, we, we did formal experiments to submerge 5,500 feet in the Santa Catalina Channel. And people were people in the submarine were able to describe where <clears throat> I, I, I was hiding. 500 miles away while they were submerged under um, 500 feet of seawater and being in a shielded environment. The idea is the Russians thought that remote viewing was a long, long wavelength. Yeah, that's wrong. Magnetic signal. So we wanted to be in a place where there was no ELF. Yeah. And there's no ELF at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the channel. And being at the bottom of the channel did not interfere with remote viewing. Yeah, it did not. Did not. Oh, that's, that that's, that's consistent. That's consistent with what I'm talking about. Yes. Well, then, then, then uh, how? I, one of the young ladies that was on tonight, I believe she took a course with you, Russ, on remote viewing. That was Lori Cardi. Yes. Yeah, and uh, she spoke very highly of uh, the training and everything like that. You know, it's fun to teach remote viewing because it's so easy to do. That is, anybody who knows how to do remote viewing well can then teach other people with no problem. It's like yeah, teaching remote viewing is basically giving people to use an experience and an opportunity make use of an ability they already have. So I, I can, can I will convincingly sit with somebody and I will talk to them until they agree that they'll do it. Can you do it can you do it over a Zoom session? <laughs> so I did it with Yakin Ranov. He was brought to us as a super hardcore skeptic. Are you talking about Aharonov? Yeah. Yeah. He, he he was brought to us by the head of our laboratory. He said, we trust this guy. And they, they went away to hide and left me with the runoff. And I described what we're going to do. Hal and the lab director are hiding someplace. And I'm going to ask you to describe where they are. He said, I don't even believe this bullshit. I don't, that doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, you don't have to believe it. If you just do what I told you to do, it's going to be all right. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. When I close my eyes, it's dark. So I said, okay, 20 minutes have gone by now. They're on their way back. We've got, it's an uh, experiment. A lot of people are involved. you got to tell me something. So quiet your mind and pretend that you see something. Just tell me, tell me what shows up. Free associate. He said, I see some ducks, some goddamn ducks. And I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, can you draw me a duck? He said, yeah, they, my group, my mother raised ducks in Israel, and I can draw you some ducks. So he drew me three ducks on a cr crossing on a lined paper, and they came back and they were hiding in the duck pond in Palo Alto a few miles away. So that's what I did for a living for 20 years. So I, I sat down with hardcore people didn't believe who didn't believe in remote viewing, but I had to be uh, persuasive enough to get the guy to agree to tell me about the, my magic words are, tell me about the surprising images that appear in your awareness. I'm going to show you something very interesting. Just tell me now about the surprising thing that show up and draw a picture. And I did that with Ranov. I did that with the Undersecretary of Defense 
I did a demonstration with Walter LaMarge, who was the Undersecretary of Defense, as a way of convincing him to let me create an Army Psychic Corps, which we did. That was the original Stargate program, where we had people from Army Intelligence, and they would come to our lab every, every day for several weeks, and I would show them how to do remote viewing, and they went back and created this Army Psychic Corps that lasted another decade. Uh, is, this, is this quantum? I mean, are we into quantum physics when we're we're looking at the way we could do this with our brains? Okay, listen, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, read that paper I told you by Pavel Pilkin. That's the physics of what he's talking about. Now, you have to take my word about that. I mean, it's not, it's not so obvious that is the, but it's what's called EPR, quantum entanglement signaling, basically explains, generally speaking, this entire phenomenon, why it's independent of spatial distance and stuff like that in time, even across time, across space. Okay. And we did that for 20 years for the government. We had a 20-year program for the CIA. And you can imagine that it's, CIA uh, is not easily amused. So if they ever caught us making a mistake or cheating, they'd be in the end of the program, of course. Yeah. And we, of course, never cheated or didn't do anything. And we had a program that ran 20 years, $25 million program doing ES, doing remote viewing at SRI. Uh, Russ, did, did you ever have Lenny Suskind be tested when he was with Aharonov? Did you ever meet Lenny Suskind? Yeah, I'm. I don't. I don't know. I know his name. I don't know. Who he, no, he never. Okay, but, never. Never crossed my laboratory. Okay, because he was a close associate of Aharon. If I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. I lost. Okay, guess, Bruce, Bruce just put up uh, quantum entanglement uh, be used for secure communications. Yeah, well, that's a little different. That's not what we're talking about. Actually, right. It sounds like it, but you see, it sounds it, but it's not. It turns out that's called quantum cryptography. That's orthodox quantum mechanics. And it with that scheme, what ha what Russ is talking about cannot happen because it lacks the action reaction idea. Okay. And that's a whole other thing because also what we're working on, see, they think they think that that uh, they can have secure encryption that cannot be hacked. In fact, with what I'm talking about, you can, <laughs> hack, it. You can hack it. Okay, yeah. so, so see, it's very subtle difference. People, most people don't can't see the difference. They can't, they don't, you know, they, they just don't have the. I don't know. They don't have the wiring there, but they don't have the education. They don't have the knowledge of science that they can even understand these distinctions I'm trying to make. So that you know, that's like when you see, oh, did the Higgs fields, the Higgs field? Yeah, they don't, they don't know anything. Yeah, I just published a paper showing that that's wrong. I, I've had a series of very sharp precognitive dreams where I would yeah. write down what what the dream was about, and within a day, I would have that event occur. Yeah, so, that so happens I, a lot. Well, that's even in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, it's the Bible. No, so I would ha I would have I would have a dream, and then if we want to talk about entanglement, we would say that my future waking dream was entangled with my sleeping dream. Yeah. Well, your I, future I, experience. I, I, yes. An easy one to explain. I dream where I was reading the New York Times in my dream, which is triply hard to do. But in this dream, the, they were reading the paper to me. And they were celebrating an anniversary for of a French impressionist. That, that was a dream. And that yes. was so unusual that I unhesitatingly told my wife about it. See, the idea is I never tell her about a dream that doesn't happen. I have to have perfect confidence that she won't believe me anymore. So I said, this is such an unusual dream. Come into my office. We'll open the New York Times and see what they got for me. And on that day, the first page of the second section was a celebration of Pablo Picasso. So, yeah. we, so I hit the key. And there was Picasso covering the whole, whole thing. And yeah, since yeah. I, since I'm a physicist, I believe in causality. I believe strongly that my dream about Picasso 
at six o'clock was caused by my experience of Picasso in front of my yeah. face. Two but I'm talking that's, all, that's that's tra that's temporal and that is temporal EPR signaling exactly. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what the what do, you think, what do you think about the idea of having your waking brain entangled with your sleeping brain? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a brain scientist. You know, I, there's nothing. I mean, I'm not against it. You know, there, there's the the belief that people are at their most creative when they're, you know, if they wake up in the middle of the night. That's the reason you should keep a notebook along your on side your bed. I don't know if either of you guys do, but yeah, no, you, know, do you get that inspiration. Yeah, I do that all the time, but I do it. I can, I just talk to the to Siri. I just talk that to the laptop. <laughs> it's on the iPhone. That's cheating. The, that doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I get a lot of a lot of my physics. I, I I find mistakes in my in my daytime physics calculation. I often find, oh, oh I forgot this. I, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, okay. Everybody. Well, that means we're closing the delta between, you know, the remote viewing capabilities and some other function of the brain. I mean, is yeah, that well, listen, a safe thing to like, say? Yeah, the, the brain is complex. I don't pretend to be a brain scientist. You know. The point of my story is that quantum entanglement entangles the information. It doesn't save the information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, it's like oh, and, 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 photons. Any, any, other, any other questions? And let's let's move on because it's getting late. Any other I questions? I see. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else out here? The people that are still on. I see. I think we yeah. had even some new people join. <laughs> This I have a I question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I have a question. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Have you guys ever heard of the Galactic Federation? Have you ever heard of the Galactic Federation? Federation. Yeah, it's in Star Trek. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Listen, okay. it, it, the answer is yes, and maybe it, it's real. Okay. I have no reason to think now that it's not real, because I've seen. I know there's at least three different kinds of aliens. Okay, now you all know that Gene Roddenberry was did work for the CIA yeah, before Gene he became Roddenberry, a prolific. Uh, yes, 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 and the Gene Roddenberry was part of Andrea Puharich's group, which I was part of, but not. I was. I never actually met Gene Roddenberry at the same time. But yes, all these people are connected. Dream Roddenberry, Star Trek is a softening up part of the disclosure operation that is really the way it is. And uh, this is all consistent. If, if Adir, if David Adir, for example, is telling the truth about Area 51, then that's, you know, the Galactic Federation, the time trial, whatever, the NHI, they're already in Area 51. And so they got... Uh, you know, they got Roddenberry with Porridge to write Star Trek because that's just a fictionalized version of what is real. And that's probably the case. At um, this point, my best estimate, probability, Bayesian probability estimate is that there is a federation and that is basically a correct picture. I could be wrong. You know, I could be wrong. Well, you know, the writers of Star Trek they attended meetings and they belonged to this group called Mind. Did you ever hear of them? Jacques well, Dupierre? You know, I just know Paharich. The nine, it says a nine, nine. Mind, M-I-N-D. Well, I know N-I-N-E. The writers belong to that group. Who did? I the want to just add. I of want Star to Trek. Add. The writers of Star Trek yeah, belong to yeah. this group. Called okay, so mind. Well, I want to add to that, if I could. Uh, yeah, Gene okay. Roddenberry and his wife were longtime readers of a book that I've been studying for forty years, called the Arantia Book. And right. there, I, I've ta I've talked to many people that they, Gene Roddenberry and his wife, uh, were yeah. avid readers and went to the study groups in, I believe, California. Now that's yeah. a link that if you're a uh, William, especially. 
you got to look into that because when you see what's in the Urantia book, a 2000 page book, uh, and then see some of the uh, episodes of Star Trek, yeah. you're going to yeah. see something really interesting of how much connection there is. Yeah, yeah. well, I think that's well known. Yeah, I, I, I knew that. Word. I knew that. Okay, so I want to make sure that that, that came up. Yeah, yeah. But the, the Urantia was channel, it was a channeling thing. Yeah, it was. It absolutely was. Oh, this is a great oh, freewheeling conversation tonight. I'm, I'm learning a lot from listening to you all. Connecting I want to throw something and perhaps get your reaction to it. Um, <clears throat> I started outlining a, a book that I'm planning on, on uh, writing, uh, which regards over my, my over 50 years in, in, in broadcast journalism. And I think it probably seems self-evident, but um, the book is going to focus on the effect of conditioning. And I think, Jack, this goes back to what you were saying. I think uh, Joe and I have talked about this many times, but mm -hmm. I think that uh, the possibility in the in the movie industry of uh, a paradigm shift caused in, in many facets, uh, oh, yeah. not only, you know, with the the commercial production of movies and uh, which allude to the fact that, you know, from the silly stuff in the fifties up through independence day and star Trek and stuff that yeah. uh, these are a way to condition the population to be of more accepting of what may in fact be a reality. And yeah. That, 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 that book, that book is all, wait, let me just say now, yes, sir. that book has been written years ago. It's called Hollywood and uh, the UFOs. Somebody wrote about that. You should look at that book. Do you know about that book? Uh, no, but I, I will. You know, it's funny because in, in public affairs in the military, uh, they they have a, a program called the Paradigm Shift, which is unlimited budget, unlimited time span. To bring yeah, well, that's what this book is about. Kind of thing. The, book is yeah. about, the book is about the military influence and the CIA in Hollywood. And also, I was part of that. I was part of that because I, I was part of Francis Ford Coppola's yeah. Close Encounters, right? Not a close encounter. Kind of back from the future. I'm oh, the model from... for 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 uh, uh, yeah, Doc, Doc, Doc Brown. Doc. It's based yeah. on me. Based on me and Kim Burafato. And 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 and, and, uh, and it was it was because of me that Jacques Vallée became technical advisor with Spielberg on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, because I brought Jacques Vallée to Francis Ford Coppola's house with Uri Geller. A Christmas party, I guess, was in '76. Was it '75? Around the, the seven, must have been '76, and uh, and that's where uh, that's how uh, Valet got connected with through Coppola with the you know with with the guys who did uh, Close Encounters. It's funny because my my present partner, by the way, just a, like, I'm not gonna mention her name, the woman I've been with for almost thirty years. <laughs> what her boy? Yeah, wait, her her boyfriend in in middle school. Was Ricky, you know, uh, Dreyfus, Richard, Richard Dreyfus? Wow, Beverly, Beverly, six uh, degrees uh, of separation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, Nick, uh, Nicole Sakach. Uh, I'm, Hi, I'm sorry if Kate. I mispronounced that. Actually, Joe, you got as close as anybody ever gets. So thank you. <laughs> it's okay. you did great. Um, I pop in and out of uh, Jack's groups and spaces often. Um, I'm usually quiet, though, and some of you guys might know me that um, I work with Grant Cameron sometimes helping him research all the crazy things he dives into. But since I had Mr. Targ here and Mr. Sarfati, I was hoping maybe I could ask a kind of a um, puzzle piecing <laughs> dot connecting question. Yes. Um, you guys brought up the Army Psy Corps. And yeah. I think that kind of coincides with uh, Jim Channon and the First yes. Earth Battalion. Absolutely, yes. And, and Colonel Alexander. Yes. yes. And I have i didn't quite know how uh, Mr. Alexander got uh, introduced into the psychic third eye spy world. But in my mind, it had to have been Mr. Channon for some reason. But yeah, that's I, not even... I, I, let, let me tell you something. I met, I first, I met, uh, John Alexander, I guess it was around 1980. He came to North Beach, the Cafe Trieste, you know, the famous Cafe Trieste where Francis Coppola mm -hmm. wrote Hanging Out, Bohemia. And I was there with Laurie Chickering, 
uh, I don't know how we, we met. Uh, and and I, I, I don't think Jim Shannon was there, but uh, this was when I was working with the Reagan think tank, the Institute for Contemporary Studies, where we were formulating things for the Strategic Defense Initiative. And somehow, right. and somehow uh, that's when I first met Alexander. Now, John Alexander, I don't know if he's, he's supposed to be on the show, because John Alexander and I, we're, we're like, um, we're I've like, been following <laughs> that, yeah. yeah I'm, hope, we're like, I'm hoping we're like, it happens. Yeah, we're like, because, because he hates, he has Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> and I kind of bought Trump. Well, so back so I was so also. We, we used to be, you know, with like in a civil war. It's like Grant, it's like, it's like Grant and Lee. Okay. He did sign on and off to this break. He was on a couple times, uh, Jack. He he signed on and off as I was watching oh, he participant. Yeah, he kind of came in and stealth. Oh yeah, we had a couple of yeah, a couple of folks coming on there. I joined late. I apologize, but no, um, no, what? No, don't get ahead. So, what's your question? Continue. Uh, the second okay. part of my question was. Um, yeah. Through the course of my research, I've interviewed a lot of NASA adjacent people, and yeah. I heard that Jim Channon had sort of taken uh, the things he learned from uh, the Psychic Spy Program and the First Earth Battalion and sort of started applying it to NASA astronaut training. Oh, huh, maybe. And, well, we hear about Tim Taylor in this community a lot and he's sort of this nasa in the background guy and he's linked with elon musk and dragon crew and he's also been known to have this uh contact modality that he's been given where he can go through a sort of process and connect with his inspiration i guess is how i would put it but so, I mean, so I just, he, is he channeling like idea is he channeling and That's the impression I get. It's it's like a morning uh, meditation routine that he goes through. <clears throat> yeah. And, yeah. you know, it helps him create the wonderful things that he does. Okay, so he I just didn't they... know if there was a missing puzzle piece there with Jim Channon and NASA and sort of this <clears throat> continuation of these processes and theories that the Third Eye Spies developed. Let me ask you, let me ask you a question now. Is he the one that Diane... Pasilka is talking about when they went to, I don't know, what's yes. He's yes. that guy. Which okay. is a little funny because, um, Jack, I think you know Grant Cameron, um, but Grant went to that same location that Tim Taylor then took Gary Nolan and Diana to, but then he blindfolded yeah. them. Why did he blindfold them? Like, <laughs> I've never known anybody else that's been taken there that's been blindfolded. It's just strange <laughs> okay well what 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 do they what did they see there what did they claim they saw them what, what why did they go there just... allegedly it was to collect pieces that oh, have the been pieces of the material yes the material pieces oh, which okay. grant grant went there and he found pieces as well is what i'm saying like many people go there and collect pieces and dig oh, for okay. them so okay. i don't know why yeah, Tim where, Taylor where, where, is... where, where, where is the site the New Mexico. pieces were being gathered where? In New Mexico. New Mexico, yeah. The yeah. thing is this, though. I know for a fact, pretty much, I know, say, with 99, 98% certainty that we have intact craft, an intact, at least one. I know about one intact craft. Right. That That is able to fly, but they, they're able to fly it, but they don't understand exactly how it works. I, I, could, I have a lot of details on on how they fly, you know, but I can't reveal those well, that's, details. That's why but, I follow you, is I think you yeah. haven't figured out. So <laughs> well I have some of it figured out. I have some I have these uh, well, what what I claim to have is that there's no more mystery. We understand, you know, I'm sort of like a, a scout, you know, like a Lewis and Clark expedition, you know, that you go out the scout, the Indian scout goes out and it goes to the top, hey, it's over here, guys. And then they can then everybody else has to come in and build the towns and all that stuff. So I'm like, you know, I'm like one of the scouts. <laughs> I all like right, that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Karen Wallow thank has you, written. Well, thank, you, thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank Karen, you. are you out there? <laughs> you have, you've had your hands raised for a while. 
She's having a problem <laughs> getting unmuted. Yeah. I'm no, Karen left. Unmute. Karen left. She said goodbye earlier. Oh, she did. Oh, yes. okay. But oh, she's uh, still my question. Okay. All right, uh, Nicole, you can go back again if you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Left. Yeah. Yes, I, I, have I have a question. Yes. The, no. the the hit the hitchhiker effect they talk about with Skinwalker Ranch. How do you understand that? Okay, just remind me. Just tell me. Define what you mean by the hitchhiker effect. So just so someone allegedly, sure. when people go and visit, some of them when they go home, take something back with them, and they have like yeah. poltergeist effects and oh, okay. orbs going around their home and. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, figures appearing, you know, dark figures yeah. appearing in their yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, wh uh, why that th that seems very um, natural to me. Why is that a problem? I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm saying not... it's a problem. I'm just saying, how do you understand it? Well, it's just that the, these the that this. Okay, if the material, if the material is genuinely from these ships. Then it has an internal energy source, and it's it's a conscious artificial intelligence, and it's connected maybe with you know what they're it's connected across the universe or whatever across time to the uh, you know to to their sources. I mean, yeah, so it makes perfect sense to me that something like that would happen. It doesn't remember it's not an inert piece of material if it's genuine material. It's not material. It's just that if they visit and they experience something at the ranch, oh, allegedly, okay. they're not taking material home. They're taking okay. themselves home. Okay, yeah, okay. But if they experience something, then they're being programmed. You know, their 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 brains have been manipulated. Yeah, sure. So how does how does that manifest physically when they go home? What do you mean? So they see things? So they're seeing, maybe they see how they Yeah, they, they see like orbs, they see like figures in their right, room. Well, the is, they, the they, is, you know, okay. sometimes there's poltergeist effects where things fly across the room. Oh, actually, material things. So, Actually, David, often remote viewers that intrude into secret operations, uh, alien operations, they're often followed. The alien can pick yeah. up the remote viewer. And uh, some people that I know of had uh, very bad experiences. They remote viewed the Hall of Hell at the Dulcie Base. And while they were in there, yeah. they realized that they were found out. And then they left, but they were followed. Yeah. But I'm glad okay, you know, you're talking. You, you know who really knows about this stuff? I mean, I, there's nothing. Well, I, well, my only role in this is to say, is there anything that cannot be explained in terms of physics, in terms of known mainstream physics? And I say, no, all this stuff, none of this stuff is, is supernatural in any sense. Now, in terms of details, the dark side, you have guys like the CI, two CIA guys, John Ramirez, and who's the other one? Uh, uh, Jim Semivan. Okay. They, they're the ones who, who apparently have had uh, bad experiences or know about that i think semi yeah, there's more than that is what i understand at least five yeah. intelligence yeah, people went there and yeah the experiences yeah yeah, yeah. there's more and there's even more. bigelow these, apparently two, yeah yeah these two are, these two ramirez and uh semi are public about it but they, uh, they've talked yeah. about it on the internet so yeah so i have no reason to doubt any of those um you know, i don't know what program that was but I can tell you, this is, I've been teaching people remote viewing for 50 years now, all over the world. And I've never had somebody come back or complain that they had a bad experience as a result of remote viewing. And I've, like to ask they they remote viewing. I've trained hundreds of people, and it's usually a very positive experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like but to ask people... David Rudiak a question. Okay, David, what? David Rudiak who's with us, yeah. I'd like to ask him a question. David, sure. was, a David was able to use uh, advanced computer technology in the 1990s to decipher the telegram that was in the hands of uh, General Ramey. And, General uh, who? Ramey. General Ramey. Uh, Roswell. Ramey. This has to do yeah, with Roswell. Roswell. Yeah, this uh, has to do with 
but he knows he knows the message. He was able to decipher it. And I remember I wrote we wrote a couple of articles about you and your message uh, on UFO Digest. I wonder if you could share the um, the message that you deciphered about the Dawah. What was the message? Well, Ramey had this press conference okay. where he displayed a weather balloon. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Remember yes. the photos that were taken? Well, in one of the photos. He's holding a message in his hand and, yeah. and, you know, got a little bit of it. Okay. I think the message is basically about what happened at Roswell. It's an update. Yeah. I think it was sent to General Vandenberg okay. at the Pentagon, who was acting chief of staff. Yeah. And Ramey was in communication with him, according to the newspapers. Yeah. And so he's updating Vandenberg and what's going on. And it's yeah. primarily about finding the bodies, which most people who read this think is in, called victims of the wreck. Yeah. And these were forwarded to a team at Fort Worth, Texas. That's yeah. the first paragraph. And yeah. it's also about finding something else, which I think they're talking about the craft itself. Yeah. And uh, the way I read it, it says at location was a wreck near Operation perhaps at the debris field and the victims of the wreck you forwarded to, I think a mortician team at Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah. That's my yeah. best guess. Yeah. Well, you know, That's Phil Corso, Phil Corso says all this. And I, I think everything Phil Corso says is true to the best of Phil Corso's knowledge, because mm -hmm. let me tell you why I think that I have totally independent co corroboration of certain things that Corso says in that book from a totally different source, independent, who never even knew of Phil Corso who he was. Okay. And this is I this is a military source. Okay. This um, is about putting technology into private industry. No, I'm from... talking about I'm talking about whatever but no, I'm talking about when Phil Corso describes the interior when he describes the ship, you know, when he describes the craft with the three little seats and the console, all that stuff, and it's empty inside, all that stuff. And the headband that, that they were wearing, that, too. The, yeah. Well, uh, yes. Uh, like, okay, I got... I just read the book over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All that stuff is true. I have independent corroboration. Independent. Uh, you know, it's like a cop. It's like a policeman, you know. You put two pieces of evidence independent. They're telling the same story. Different, different incidents, but the same machinery, same technology. Okay. Uh, uh, also, so, a little, a, a little ex expansion of this. The Bell Labs, the picture, you know, the image behind me on my my screen. Uh, that Bell Labs is where they got the laser technology, the fiber optic technology. Yeah, the transistor yeah. was invented there, but 1947. The, the timeline wouldn't be right for that because a, a physicist explained to me that it would have taken a couple of years to make all the different components that had to go into that particular type of uh, transistor. They had transistors hmm. before, transistor-like devices before, but that one there was not was not credited to the Roswell crash. But the other technologies were. Uh, uh, and that kind of goes along with what Corso said as well, that he yeah. had the job of transferring uh, to existing contracts for work that contractors were already doing for the army. Yeah, yeah, I have no so radar I, and all that stuff is right. Yeah. I have right no here. reason to doubt. I have no reason to doubt anything that Corso says. I think he's told the truth to the best of his memory. I'm just older, you know, sometimes forget. But I don't think Corso is an intentionally has tried to deceive anybody and i think he's telling the truth i think the same thing with david grush by the way um so you know they could be mistaken in certain details they may misremember or they may not understand They're exactly human. What... It, yeah, me, right. if i could just add a couple things david uh with re uh relating to that uh message that actually was on perforated teletype paper the font matched the uh, uh, the teletypes uh, back in the 70s when I was in New Mexico working in news, we still had those operating. So I kind of add some credibility to that. 
Also, at some point, Jack, it, it, in great detail, Joe's aware of the story. I'd like to follow up with you about my connection with a gentleman from Bell Labs regarding the metamaterials. It's uh, it's quite an interesting well, you know story. How, you know yeah. how to contact me. Contact me by email. Just Jack Sarkar. I will. Email, I will because it's it's too long to take up here, but yeah. Uh, yeah. it's yeah. a yeah. very fascinating tie-in and corroboration, as you say. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, one other thing. One other thing. I, I think I met uh, Phil Corso around 1949-1950. I think I met him. I was my grandfather worked for the army uh, at the quartermaster corps down at the uh, John you know the garment district around 14th Street, John Watermaker Building, right around there. And I was living with my grandparents at the time. Uh, I was about eight years old, ten years old, I guess, and. Um, and I used to go down to hang out with my grandfather. I was able to, you know, take the subway from the Bronx and just go down there. Things were safer there for kids, you know. So it was probably must have been forty nine, maybe nineteen fifty. And I would play. The, I was they. I was allowed to play at the headquarters of Army Quartermasters, which is kind of interesting. They, they allowed kids in, right? It was pretty informal there, right? And they had different floors. On one floor they had the uh, um, tropical clothing, and then the the uh, the um, dress code and then the you know, Arctic Arctic clothing. And I was able to just run around and <laughs> start a playground for me. Okay. And then I would meet these army. My grandfather was there. I would meet these army officers. And I was, you know, I was reading science. I was a smart kid. I was reading, you know, I wanted to go to build rockets and all, you know, science fiction. I was reading all the amazing stuff. Uh, the, the, you know, the pulp magazines, 25 cents, yeah. analog science fiction. I all know about L. Ron Hubbard, I think, was already writing stuff in the science fiction magazines. I was reading all that stuff. And when I opened up the uh, the day after Roswell, and I saw the picture right away. You know, it like, I'm pretty sure, I can't, I don't know if 100, it was, a, it was some army guy, but when I saw Phil Corso, I think it was Phil Corso. But if it wasn't Phil Corso, it was somebody like in the same, because, you know, they would talk, I would, you know, I was, I remember talking about flying saucers and I want to build rockets to go into space and all that kind of stuff. I'm a 10 year old kid. And they were encouraging me to do that. Yeah, yeah. The same, same thing happened yeah. to me. I got a letter from Werner von Braun because I like drawing rockets. Yeah. And my yeah, mother, yeah. And I my mother sent her off to Huntsville. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, we built rockets also. We had the junior American rocket. We, you know, we fired rock. Oh, yeah. We were, this is a little late. I was 12, 13. <laughs> it was a group of kids. And we were given, we were allowed to fire our rockets at Floyd Bennett Naval Air Station in Brooklyn. <laughs> I have photographs. I have photographs of, of, of us doing that. <laughs> this was after the army, after the, uh, you know. You know, the kids so have we, been, kids are now relegated and, and, to bottle rockets. Water, yeah, yeah. water we're, we're, propelled. We're, yeah. So we were part of this program, you know, and then also, yeah, and then it was also in a special program all through high school from Columbia University. Uh, uh, and uh, I met Isaac Asimov, actually, and, I hope I'm, you know, and, and, they, and they sent me to, uh, I, I went to Cornell. I could have gone to MIT, Cornell, or University of Chicago, full scholarships. And um, it was part of this army project uh, from uh, William Sheldon at uh, Columbia University was working with uh, what, uh, what the hell? Eugene McDermott. Eugene McDermott, one of the founders of Texas Instruments. Okay. And they were studying, you know, these genius kids and these guys from Albuquerque would come. And, you know, we were, uh, this was the McCarthy era. So we were, you know, told about how we have to fight the Russians, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> And but about flying saucers, and they tested us for paranormal. They wanted to see if we could, you know, do telepathy and move stuff with our minds, all that kind of stuff. And uh, let's see what else did they, uh, yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, we were talking about flying saucers. And this is all through, through high school, three years of high school. And oh, yeah, and then, uh, uh, and then this guy they wrote this 10 page thing. That's how I got into college. You know, my parents, my mother. Parents didn't have much money. I was sent to Cornell and Ivy League school. I studied with Hans Bader. Everything was paid for. I didn't have to pay anything. My mother sent me $20 a week. I'm at an Ivy League school here for four years. 
<laughs> Jack, can I ask you another quick question yeah. about something? Um, I worked for a, a number of years with a guy named Mark Leone, and he uh, published some of the books by Stan Romanek. And and there, I was at a retreat where we did uh, some interviews with him. And theoretically, according to the story, Stan had in the middle of the night at one point uh, – theoretically was abducted but at one point uh in denver uh he wrote formulas all over the bedroom wall with his wife's lipstick he was sleepwalking type of thing claude cool. swanson uh reviewed those formulas do you are you familiar with him do you remember him he no, just died have, recently no, I, you'd have to he's a them. princeton physicist and he claimed that there are that the formula is related to time travel and i would like to get you maybe one of the copies of the books and so let you it's you, pretty if, well if vetted. You do, just if you have the book, just you know, uh, scan it or take photographs with your iPhone and just okay. send me, you know, pictures of it. Yeah. Yeah, we take did a, a, an year, event in New this? Jersey. I'm sorry. What year did this happen? Uh, this what was year? in the '90s. He had he had a range and a when? broad range of things happen through the '80s and '90s. Um, the '80s and '90s. Okay. Yeah, and uh, actually, we did an event where him, him and his wife came back to uh, Clinton, New Jersey. Mark and I put it on. Actually, Gl uh, Grant Cameron uh, zoomed in, was it, zoom in on that panel and, and interviewed them also. Um, it, it's a very interesting story because the the wide range of uh, of uh, occurrences that took place in uh, during his life were uh, pretty well dead? vetted and pretty wide. So is he dead? No, 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 no. Uh, it's a very long story. Uh, he was uh, theoretically, uh, I, I, you know, he was doing uh, an interview with, a, uh, I think, Channel 5 in Denver in a park. And UFOs came over at that time. He had oh, yeah. all kinds like of stuff. Like the sky Bledsoe. You know, Bledsoe yeah. Who's, you know, yeah. Such, yeah. But anyway, I was wondering whether the formulas made any sense. So I'll take some pictures of those formulas and get them over to you. Yeah, yeah. Show me the formulas. It's, I mean, yeah. it's, you know. see if there's any merit to it. But but Claude Swanson said that uh, they seem to uh, be very advanced, and certainly Stan did not have that kind of capability. But you know, there are pictures of them on the on the bedroom wall over a bedroom wall. He didn't know what they were. Oh, okay. What's well, just sound? Okay. So, any other questions? Um, sure. Some people had them, but they they can activate their um, mics apparently. Can they Bruce, type? Did you, they... Bruce, did you do anything or? Can you chat? No, no, I have no, I haven't blocked anybody at all. Okay, maybe be. not so long. It just got tired and it's no longer working. <laughs> yeah, check the mouse. Karen came back in. Karen, if you're with us and you still have a question, please jump in. Uh, Karen, uh, she uh, said she couldn't activate her microphone. No, okay, but she could type. We could hear her. We could see her. She, she's right. just type. Just type. I don't know why she can't unmute. Just yeah, she should be able to uh, unmute. She could. She could type a question. Right, just type. Karen, can you type? I like to see. Yeah. Come on, cuz you can do it. <laughs> so long, Jack. Thanks for inviting me. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Oh yeah, hey, uh, 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 Russ. When is your party? When is your birthday? Again, I forgot. In May. April thirteenth. April thirteenth. Okay, I hope to. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll. There's a chance I may have to go to London before that, but probably not. If not, I'll. Oh. I'll here, uh, K uh, okay. Karen just uh, left a message here. Has anyone night, Russ. has anyone done a remote viewing of the future of our Earth? Well, yeah. Joe McManigal has a, a book that he wrote about looking fifty years off into the future. Joe McManigal. And he was he's probably the outstanding living remote viewer. Okay, boys and girls, thank you very much. Good night. Yes, uh, thanks yeah. for uh, being here, Russ. Thank you, Russell. Good night, Russell, and happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Okay. Yeah. All right, Jack, thank you. Thank you for uh, your participation. And yeah, great. Think, yeah it's almost a lot of hours. fun. We've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed okay. it. Thank also, you. Also, thank yeah. everybody what? out there. Thank you all. Okay. Next month, so, we have Craig Capabasso. He's going to be talking about the... Uh, 
a number of alien civilizations that we have to deal with. Wait, who did you say? Bledsoe? Not Bledsoe. Who? No, no, no. Uh, Craig, uh, Craig Capabasso. He wrote a number of books uh, about the alien presence. And he made the movie Stranger. Hey, by the way, and he made a movie too, Stranger right, at the before, Pentagon. Okay, wait. Before we end, there's a very good series. It's a fun, it's a comedy yeah, sort of called Resident Alien. On that uh, I, I, I'm yeah, hooked on that. I'm hooked on that. Yes, <laughs> it's pretty good. It's, it's funny. You know, it's pretty it good. That's, it's a great a great show. Yes, very yeah. entertaining. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Bye. Hey, bye, bye, Jack. Thanks again. Bye. I'll give you their email so you can uh, send them. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Hey. We'll catch you later. Hey, thanks a lot. This was great. Really fun. <laughs> Even if he doesn't like And nobody Higgs. killed each other. That's the great part. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he doesn't like the Higgs field. It was great. <laughs> All right. Good night, folks. Okay. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Joe. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you, a good everyone. night. Be safe. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah.